here. Cool. All right. Good evening, everybody. Well, well, it is another wonderful evening, rainy evening, actually, but I'd like to welcome everybody here. Thanks for taking your time. Um, uh, to my official Odin members, I love you all. I miss you all. Um, heartfelt love you and miss you. Really, I do. Uh, you know, we're so used to having our meetings in person. We have some wonderful food together. Uh, we get to chat. Uh, you know, it's just amazing. So I really miss that. I'm looking forward to getting back to that in our new year um, for our Odin year. But for those who, are, have who have joined us, who are not official members, you're still part of our family. So we're excited to have you guys join us. We have a great topic today and a great speaker as well. Um, before we start that, I'm just going to actually share my screen. Um, so here we go. And let's just go into ours. All right. So you guys can see that okay? Yes, sir. Perfect. So um, we are going to record this webinar. So this will be posted on our YouTube page. Um, and I will send everybody the link to that. I know Hisham will be posting this on the Dentistry Academy site as well, Hisham? Perhaps? Yes, we'll say yes. Okay, so um, just a bit of housekeeping. Please make sure that you do- That's correct, that. that's correct. Perfect, awesome. So just please make sure that you do put your name and email address in the chat. There is going to be a verification code at the end, and that's the AGD rules. I can't give that out now. That AGD verification code will be given to you at the end. So just make sure that you put your name and email address in the chat at the end, okay? And you will put that in with a verification code. You can do it now, but we need to see the verification code beside your email address and your name, okay? In order to satisfy the AGD requirements. You will all receive category two CE credits and that will be offered through Ontario Dental Implant Network as we always do for our ODIN group. Um, I do want to have a special shout out to Hisham from Dentistry Academy for hosting and always helping out um, for doing all the wonderful things that he does for our profession just with the webinars he's been running with the Dental Track series. I know myself and both Nahid have lectured and, and we've all had the opportunity to help our fellow dental colleagues. So um, the final session for that is tomorrow. Uh, it's with Dr. Mean Quick. He's an amazing lecturer, amazing speaker. He also speaks for Dentsplice Rona, um, very business savvy. Um, I would not, I would encourage you all to, to, to see that, but that's tomorrow and to join, you just visit the dtacademy.ca site and there's a password, which has always been the capital track 20. So I'll post that again on our site. So this was our calendar for the year. I know it's hard to look back, but our first meeting at Lamborghini was July 10th, where we had our meeting of the members. We gave away some nice gifts. Um, it was amazing. We had some amazing topics throughout so today obviously is our last topic um, and I'm excited for it. Uh, make sure you visit our website as well where I do put post events um, and also our live surgery observation that members have access to to come and watch. Uh, you can also see those surgeries on that site. Um, the 2020, the new year, a lot of people have been asking me about the new year and the new session, what's happening with that. So I thought this year we were gonna include an extra meeting. So instead of our regular seven meetings a year, there will be eight meetings a year and they're always on Wednesday evenings. Normally they're at the High Austin training facility in Markham. I do have some options for those members who can't participate to the meetings, maybe just wanna be part of the group chat, which I'll talk about in a second. This is our calendar for the new year. July 8th is pending what happens with our guidelines, but we also have another welcome meet and greet. I will try to find a cool place to do that. Um, we'll have a few different topics throughout the year. Um, that have been interested. So we surveyed our members on what topics they wanted to hear about. And I think we've covered everything. I wanted to include a lot of good hands on. We have some great support by our sponsors, which we'll get to as well. Um, this is the registration form that has been created. Um, so I would hopefully, uh, what I'm going to get, I'm going to send that out. The membership fee is the same as last year. It's $17.95. Um, it'll give you access to all the wonderful things that you've been enjoyed and more. Um, we've been going to be doing some group purchasing. As you know, we did some surgically clean air units as a group, got an amazing price. Um, so the goal is just to push this to the next level, but we need members to support that. If you are living in Ottawa or Vancouver or somewhere else, you can also join our group. You can maybe just join the group chat. All of us some doctors who've flown in and spent some days with us or even attended some of the meetings. So it's really what is going to get you to the next level and help you to grow as a dentist and continue to be part of our community. 
So the events calendar normally is posted on our site. Of course, it's not now because we don't have any surgeries, but it will be. And I just encourage you all to respond to the email, a yes or a no, when we send out the membership form. We're gonna have a deadline of about three weeks um, because I need to get a gauge as to how many people so I can plan the year, okay? If you have any questions, as of now, the group chat is open, it's free um, to take access. All, all of you have been uh, participating in that and hopefully benefiting from that, but just please ensure that you do have one topic per, um, you know, per uh, thread so that we can all benefit and keep things organized as possible, okay? So other than that, make sure you like, we have a Facebook and an Ontario uh, uh, Instagram page. Make sure you like those. You can be updated with all the things that we have. Now we do have some amazing sponsors, as you know, throughout the year, last several years, we've been running the program. Um, the first sponsor is Denmat. Unfortunately, they were not able to be with us. A lot of the staff have been furloughed, but I did want to thank them from the bottom of my heart. And they are made a commitment to sponsor us again next year to help with courses and fee reductions and, and savings on their instrumentation um, as well through Hartzell. So thank you guys for that. We have Shaw as well, who's been an amazing sponsor. They've, they've kept our price points very, very nicely uh, uh, for high Austin users in particular, as far as our, our all-in-one fees. They've been amazing with their customer support. So we do have a mic from Shaw, and I think Ali is also here as well. So did you guys want to just say a few words to our members? Mike? Uh, yeah, Ali, you, you, am I okay to go? <laughs> um, I, I, I just want to say, Dr. Sheikh, thank you so much for all your support. It means a lot. Uh, it's a difficult time. I'm, 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 I'm very honored to be part of this family, but uh, I won't take more time. Um, Michael, please go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Mike DePalagrin. I'm the sales rep for Shaw Dental Labs uh, in southwestern Ontario. Um, about half of you are probably familiar with me and, and the lab uh, through Azim's group, the Odin Network. Um, the rest of you are, are now joining in. We uh, say hi to you and, and hope that we can work together on some level in the future. Um, for those of you that don't know Shaw, we're kind of the OG of the lab world. We've been around since 1944, um, kind of the sort of early days of lab work in the, uh, in the Ontario dental lab community. So we're over 75 years old. Um, we currently have five locations, um, Ottawa, Kingston, Toronto, Brampton, and London. Um, during the pandemic times where everyone's closed down, the labs are actually still open. Our lab managers are, are manning the fort and are open for any type of emergency type work. Um, we're a full service digital lab, um, so we can handle all aspects of your, of your dental lab business. Um, we one of the things we wanted to stress was make sure you guys subscribe to their YouTube channel because if they got really good, really good, uh, powerful stuff on there that kind of shows you about the lab work as well, right, Mike? Yeah, we've just been developing that over the last because they now have some time to do that. Um, it's kind of a mixed blessing. We've been able to sort of advance our YouTube channel and do some some more documentary style videos of of lab processes and and things that people want that dentists want to know about the lab and, and how to, to work with the lab and things like that. So I, I, I encourage you to check out that YouTube channel. There's a lot of uh, good information there. Um, so yeah, we've been um, kind of just waiting for you guys to get back to work and letting you know that we're ready when you are. And we have, we've sort of been there to accommodate any of your emergency needs uh, through this pandemic. Great. Well, Thanks a lot, Mike. Um, I know you guys have an amazing offer, as you guys always do, a promotion for our Odin members. So they've offered about a 20% discount on their Shaw Super Translucent Crowns. So they're normally about 236, but they've got a promo now for us. They have a discount code you guys can note. As long as you're a registered an Odin member, it'll be under Azim Shaw ST, capital ST. And uh, you can get up to three units um, up there. And they're beautiful, beautiful crowns. I've seen them. I've used them in my own practice as well. Um, so that, that is great. We really appreciate that, Ali and Mike. Um, and you guys have been an amazing support. And I am continuing looking forward to working with you guys in the coming year as well. Thank you. Thanks. So we also have Hi Austin. Um, we've got Dinesh online here, right, Dinesh? Is Dinesh here? Um, there we go. Yes. 
Okay. Hello, everyone. This is Dinesh uh, from Hyacin Implants. Um, thank you, Azim, uh, for this opportunity. Um, in like just brief introduction about Hyacin. Um, as per third party reports, we are in the top five uh, in the world today. In fact, according to Strawman, in some of their presentations last year, uh, Hyacin is the second largest implant company in the world today. And this is according to Strawman. And when I say second largest, this is in terms of the number of implants placed. So the company has been growing steadily. Um, it's called Hyacin in North America, but globally the company is called Ostom. And if you look up Ostom, uh, Ostom is the largest dental company in Korea. Uh, it's not limited only to implants. They are, are on top of technology. So they are into everything right from uh, CBCT machines, dental chairs, materials, etc. It is one of the, it is the largest dental company of Korea. Uh, we launched in Canada in 2011 as Hyacin. Um, started off with a lot of education programs. In fact, Azim was one of our first key opinion leaders and instructors. Uh, we, stood, we run a lot of basic implant programs, advanced implant programs. Now, after completing the basic programs, the doctors are looking for ongoing support. That's when uh, Azim started off with the Odin group, and we are proud to be associated uh, with him since the inception of the Odin, and I'm really proud to see where it is today. Uh, I see 100 members and growing, uh, really happy with that. Uh, have been supporting Odin and um, supporting the doctors, whether it comes to just uh, sub, uh, customer service or whether it is chair side assistance um, for their cases. Uh, as part of this um, last day, the last session of the year, just wanted to offer these promotions to all the Odin members. Uh, we have this course coming up, the webinar coming up on June 6th. It is by Dr. David Chong. It's called Guided Bone Degeneration Myths and Facts. It is a paid webinar, but we are offering it complimentary to all the Odin members. Initially, it was offered complimentary only to Hyosin users, but now we've decided to offer it complimentary to all the Odin members as well. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard Dr. David Chong, he is a faculty member of the NYU uh, Implant Dentistry Program. Uh, he's one of the few diplomates of the ICOI and the ABOI. Um, he's a founder and director of the Think Dental Implant Institute and the Manhattan Implant uh, Study Group of New York University. He's very renowned and he is very good in what he um, teaches. Uh, besides that, also wanted to give the promotion on the casket. I know Azim is huge on the Hyosin casket. So wanted to give this promotion out to the new Odin members. Um, the casket uh, retail price is 2500 but as a promotion, you can get it for 2200 And the casket plus is 3000 You can get it for 2500 And in addition to the reduced cost, you will also get a complimentary prosthetic kit. Um, that's Perfect. it for now. Uh, thank you once again, Azim, and also Dr. Hisham and the team at the DT Academy. Thank you so much. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Nash. You guys have been a great support. Um, so in addition to that, we're planning on having an advanced implant surgical continuum where you can bring in a patient under surgical mentorship and perform the surgery under supervision. So that is coming. We'll get some more details out. A surgical room, I don't know if Dan is on. I'm not sure if he was able to make it today. Dan, perhaps, Samson, no, maybe. But he's always been a great support for our courses and supplying products and services. Uh, great uh, Canadian companies. So again, support them. They've always had amazing stuff. And so we're excited to have them again as a sponsor for the coming year. Um, and uh, we'll also have Surgical Clean Air jump on as well, just to help our doctors with, uh, with those units too. So um, to that, now we've taken care of all our housekeeping items. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our amazing speaker, Dr. Nahid Mohammed. He is a periodontist in uh, Mississauga. He's got an office in Mississauga and Oakville. I'm not going to read his bio, but I can tell you, Solid guy, straight up guy, has been extremely helpful, uh, has done multiple webinars for the community, um, very talented, um, his photography is amazing, his Instagram page, I highly recommend checking it out. Uh, for those of you who want to get into connective tissue grafting, you know, I think today is going to be the day where we can learn a lot about what we can do, maybe cases we can start off with, but also those cases that we need to refer out um, because our patients definitely can benefit from this procedure. And having somebody like him and his expertise, I've seen his work is just phenomenal. 
So um, I will now pass it over to my good friend and colleague, um, Dr. Nahid Mohammed. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and you should be good to go, my friend. All right. All right. Awesome. Perfect. Up. Yeah, okay. perfect. Okay, guys, uh, first of all, just uh, I want to just say thank you to Azim, the Odin Network, Dentistry, and everyone that's sort of involved and sponsors and everyone that's kind of made this happen. Uh, you know, Azim had asked me to do this lecture for a while, and, you know, he just mentioned that I'm helping him out, but, you know, he's actually helping me out, you know, from a specialist point of view, you know, we're, we work on a referral basis, so really this is free marketing for me in a sense and you know it allows me to get my name out so again you know Azim thanks for that because it, it helps the practice especially with these uh you know upcoming times you know we don't know how it's going to be so let's uh, enough about COVID and everything hopefully next week we'll get some news that we'll be you know practicing soon and you can start to use things like this so today I'm going to talk about soft tissue grafting uh, I'm going to go over various indications for soft tissue grafts and you know how I use them in and how you can use them in your, your practice, you know. So, you know, in general, you know, most people think soft tissue grafts, they think recession, but there's actually quite a lot of different options and uses for tissue grafts. You know, you have, you know, obviously the number one most common one is root coverage. We have, you know, building keratinized tissue, especially around teeth and implants. You have increase in tissue contours for prosthetics. It can be something as simple as a pontic site to make it look more natural, or even building up tissue contours for an implant site. There's reconstruction of loss volume. Whenever we have cases where there's, you know, either some ridge atrophy, sometimes it's a combination of building up the ridge with both bone and soft tissue. And then aesthetics and implant dentistry, you know, there. All of my anterior cases, you know, unless the patient has a really thick tissue biotype, I always do some sort of tissue grafting for all my aesthetic implant cases. And, and you'll see later on in, the, in the, some of the slides why and how this is beneficial. And then lastly, papilla reconstruction. We don't get a lot of these, but they're very case specific in order to work very well. But, you know, soft tissue is, is a good thing that you can use to build up some sort of papilla shape. So gingival recession, you know, when we, when we see gingival recession, what we see clinically is, you know, loss of gingiva. You know, we noticed that the marginal gingiva has started to recede exposing the root surface of the tooth. And, you know, you never see the bone. But it's also affected by bone, meaning that, you know, what really happens is you start off with the bone dehiscence and because of inflammation or other factors. And then what happens is the soft tissue follows this bone loss. And so, you know, bone loss has to happen first before soft tissue because uh, you've never seen any cases of recession where you actually still see the bone. So bone dehiscences, they, they happen due to a different, a bunch of things. You know, it can be something as simple as, you know, the anatomy, whether the, the tooth was naturally more prominent, making the, the bone of the buccal bone quite thin. It could be orthodontic treatment that moved the tooth outside the alveolar envelope. It can start because of inflammation or even occlusal trauma. So when we look at a case like this, you know, we see the, the thin tissue biotype. You see, you know, pretty much no keratinized tissue. You can almost see the root there. You can see a prominent root. So if we lift, were to lift the flap, this is what we see underneath. You, know, you already see some sort of dehiscence. There's a little bit of bone loss. So a case like this, when you see what's going on underneath, this likely, if not treated proactively, may at some point in the future end up with some sort of recession defect. You know, so what, what causes recession? You know, back in the day, most people would think, oh, it's just aggressive tooth brushing. Now we know that it's, it's a whole bunch of factors and they all sort of come into play. They all have their part, you know. Number one is uh, buccal bony dehiscence, you know, an anatomical abnormality, you know, if the malpositioning of the teeth or if there's a root prominence, orthodontic treatment that pushes a tooth outside the alveolar envelope, you know, periodontal disease, which causes inflammation, uh, invasion of biologic width, you know, sometimes with the restorative dentistry, if you impinge on that, the biologic width, then the body does create an inflammatory reaction and tries to remodel this. And sometimes recession is uh, 
uh, factor that happens. Occlusal trauma, occlusal trauma usually has to have inflammation as well in order to have an effect, but uh, not really on its own. But it is, you know, a combination effect. Bone loss, you know, when we lose bone, you notice the tissues recede naturally. You lose papilla, pre-existing recession, you know plaque, frenopoles, iatrogenic causes like habits, like biting on pens, using their fingernails to rub on the teeth, you know, other sort of oral habits. So gingival restoration sometimes can cause uh, recession by being plaque traps, you know, they're irritants where, which collect plaque, cr uh, create inflammation and, and end up with the more aggressive or progressive recession. And then finally, age. Age, you know, as we age, we know we get some sort of bone loss and tissue changes. And so with this attachment loss that happens naturally with age, you end up with recession. And so all these things all come into play. So usually when I look at a case and I see, you know, some recession, there's a, I look at all the factors involved and some factors you just can't change and some factors you can't. So what you can change, you change prior to treatment. Okay. So thin tissue biotype, you know, we all know has a greater risk of recession compared to thick tissue biotypes. You know, if you have thick tissue, you're more likely and more prone to having pocketing as opposed to actual gingival recession. In this image here, you can see a case. This is a lady that came to us. Uh, you can see some mild recession already starting on, on the canine and the laterals. This was a post-ortho treatment. Uh, they noticed that after the treatment that, you know, the teeth are very buckly positioned in order to sort of expand the, the arch and be able to align the teeth. But by doing so, you've also pushed the teeth outside of the, the bone. And especially with her thin tissue biotype, this is something that, you know, will start to progressively get worse over the years. And you can start to, you know, you can see on the 3-3 and the 3-2, there is some recession starting. And literally, you can see all the, the teeth from canine to canine have recession. So something like this, we'd proactively treat with you know, possibly a free gingival graft to thicken that tissue and gain a nice wide band of keratinized tissue to make sure that this is stabilized. Here's another case. You can see lack of keratinized tissue. There's a freno pull. You can see the positioning of the tooth. So all of these factors sort of have added to the fact that you know, this site has recession. Something like this you know, would probably benefit from some sort of a graft, a free gingival or connective tissue, as well as lingual movement of the tooth to bring it back into the bone. Another case, same thing. This is post ortho. You can see the tooth, uh, the root actually is positioned outside the envelope. There's no uh, attachment there. There's literally, it's just mucosa and, and the muscle pull and the vestibule basically is where the gingival margin is. So cases like this, again, have to be treated because they just do, they get worse. And as they get worse, you get more and more bone loss. So the other things that are important is that, you know, you have to remove the biofilm. You have to clean the root surface and make sure that it's maintained and cleaned or else, you know, you can get progression of disease and also the st stability of the wound, meaning that, you know, when we treat these things, we want to have a stable site. There can't be any movement. There can't be any disruption of the blood clot. Uh, the flap design has to be perfect and the suturing and everything has to aid in this. So, you know, wound stability, is key to get a good result after we treat a site. So what are the goals of soft tissue grafting? You know, what, what do I try to do? What is my intention? So depending on the case, you know, number one is, you know, from a health point, we want to gain a wider band of attached keratinized tissue. You want to gain root coverage in some cases, you know, if it's an aesthetic thing, we want to sometimes get a little bit of both. Sometimes it's no attachment, but and recession and you want to get that band of tissue as well as gain the root coverage to make it look nicer. Sometimes we just want to increase the soft tissue thickness. You know, there's no recession yet, but we want to thicken the tissue to prevent uh, progression. Or if it's something from an aesthetics point, you know, thicker tissue allows you to mold and make things look better. If there's a freno pull, and you know, sometimes you want to eliminate that because that also is a, a causative factor in the future with attachment loss. And sometimes it could be as simple as, you know, recreating vestibular death, you know, cases sometimes post bone augmentation can sometimes lose that vestibular death uh, you, and that causes tension. You want to re, you know, the mucogingival junction gets repositioned. So sometimes grafting is needed to rebuild the vestibule or, or gain some attachment and sometimes even increase the keratinized tissue. And then lastly, you know, soft tissue grafting can improve aesthetics, you know, it can be something from in the sense of increasing tip, uh, tissue thickness, root coverage, or even with regards to implants and how 
you know, the final crown can seem or become, you know, more natural based on soft tissue profiles. So predictability of root coverage. You know, I get a lot of questions sometimes say, you know, when you do the, you treat your recession, how long does it last? You know, is it something that's good for like a month or two? And then like two years later, you're, you're back and it starts again. And, you know, most of this is based on certain things, you know, patient factors, defects, factors, techniques, specific factors. So, you know, in order to get a predictable result, you have to be able to control these factors and also understand the type of recession or the type of defect there is. You know, sometimes you'll see if there's a lot of bone loss and loss of papilla, a case like this, very unlikely to actually gain complete root coverage. And you have to know this, you know, so that you can be predictable with what your expectations are. So patient specific factors, obviously their age, you know, uh, their diabetes, if they're diabetic, if they're controlled or uncontrolled, smoking, things like immunosuppression. A lot of people nowadays, we see a lot of autoimmune diseases. So they're on some sort of steroid or some sort of immunosuppressants. These can affect the healing, especially if you're going to use things like alloderm or the dermal allografts. And then genetic predisposition, meaning that sometimes people, you know, if you naturally have a thin tissue biotype or, or, or a small jaw and, and prominent large teeth, these things uh, genetically, even just their, their health, you know, uh, things like clotting factors. And so all these things can affect the result or the actual procedure itself. So some of these you can't really control other than, you know, things like smoking, diabetes, and like bad habits and stuff. But what you can control, you know, it's good to sort of have this under control before you treat the patient or at least have them understand the risk so that, you know, you don't promise something that you can't deliver. Now, defect specific sites. These are things like the actual site itself. What do we look for in a site? You know, number one is the first thing I look for, especially for root coverage, is to look at whether there's any interproximal bone loss. So I take a look at the papillas and make sure that there's no loss of papilla or no black triangle visible because that's a sign of bone loss. The, we look at the dimensions of the recession. Is it a weird wide or shallow recession? Is it deep, meaning like, you know, how wide is it and how long it is? going from a apical coronal dimension. These also can affect the predictability. Uh, Cratinized tissue, you know, is there cratinized tissue in the site? At the margin, even if there is recession, do we have a band of cratinized tissue or is there nothing? You know, these can affect the type of technique you use as well as how predictable your flap management can be. Absence of inflammation, the residual depth of vestibule, uh, that's more regarding tension you know if you have a very shallow vestibule and a, a large amount of recession if you're going to chronally position that you're going to have a lot of tension so you have to compensate for that or stage your treatment and then the the position of the tooth in the alveolar arch meaning that if that tooth is sort of prominently outside the alveolar envelope and out of the bone you know that means that's a large avascular surface with tension that may or may not get complete root cover. So the further out it is out of the bone, the more tension there is. And remember the root surface is avascular. So that's a surface where there's no blood supply. So all these things can make things more difficult and make it more unpredictable. So technique specific factors. These are things like, you know, when you're doing your, your procedure, you want to make sure that if you're using or creating a flap, you have, you know, especially if you're doing a split thickness flap that you want to only position you want to make sure that you know it's at least about 0.8 which is a study had found out that 0.8 is like the critical number obviously i prefer something a little bit more thicker closer to one or two uh the th thickness of the graft you know you don't want to have a graft that's too thick because remember once it gets transplanted the graft has to regain its vascularity has to get its blood supply again so the thicker it is the harder it is to get much blood supply and you end up with a lot of graft sh sh shrinkage and necrosis Obviously, when we're looking at using uh, coronally positioned flaps for root coverage, you want to make sure that there's no tension because as soon as that patient walks out that door the next day, all your stitches are going to tear out if there's tension. So this is very important. You have to have tension-free closure. I usually make sure that when we do this, we overcorrect to the level of where we want, meaning that I usually try to go about a millimeter or two past the CEJ for root coverage because I know there's going to be a little bit of tension, some swelling. So as things expand and swell and then shrink back, we still make sure that it ends up at the right level. So I always try to overcorrect my root coverage if I can.
And then you want to use microsurgical technique, meaning that, you know, you want to use uh, fine incisions. Uh, you have to be very gentle with your management. No big flaps where there's tearing and things like that. So you want to cause minimal trauma to the tissue because it'll heal much faster and you have less disruption of blood supply to the area. And right now, what we know is that, you know, a clinically advanced flap with autogenous or parallel connective tissue is the most predictable way and most long-term stable way to gain blue coverage. So let's look at classifications. You know, when we look at, uh, when I look at uh, a case and it comes into the office and, and they've been referred for root coverage or for recession, I look at the tooth and the site and, and we, we sort of mentally classify which class it is. So class one is usually where you don't have any interproximal bone loss and the recession is basically just within the mucogenical junction. I'm just gonna to go to another slide because this shows us visually. So here we go. So class one, you can see that it's, you know, the papilla peaks are filled in, so there's no bone loss, and the recession is within the mucogingival junction, meaning it's within the keratinized tissue. It's not past the mucogingival junction. Class two, same thing, but papillas are filled in. There's no bone loss, but in this case, you have the recession going past the mucogingival junction. The other thing to note is if you have recession that is still sort of at or above the mucogingival junction, but you can probe past the mucogingival junction where there's no attachment, then that also is considered a class two. And then class three, you can start to see class three where, you know, there's recession, but also now a little bit of bone loss. You can see now the black triangles, the loss of papilla, and then class four is just a little bit more advanced form of class three where there's a lot more bone loss and, and recession. So, in, in cases like this, class one and class two recession defects are, are very predictable to gain 100% root coverage. When you look at class three and class fours and you start to see loss of papilla, these cases are very difficult to treat to gain 100% root coverage. And, and most likely with cases like this, I don't promise anything. You know, in cases like this, if we're trying to save and, and maintain the tooth, I look towards something more in the lines of a free gingival graft to just get a thick band of keratinized attached tissue in the site to keep the, the area stable. So this is just a, uh, some clinical pictures of some cases that show the different classifications. So this one, you can see the recession is well within the mucogenical junction and the papillas show complete fill. So this is a class one. So to be able to get root coverage for this, it's fairly easy. And this is something that I could easily just tell the patient that, you know what, 100% will we'll be able to cover this. This is a class two, same like class one, but here you can see the recession is going to the mucogingival junction. And in this case, you can actually probe past the junction. So this is considered a class two. Class three here again, you see a little bit of loss of papilla, some bone loss, and then class four, advanced bone loss. So usually class four cases, these are advanced bone loss. In this case, this is a hopeless tooth, but if it was just, a, if it wasn't hopeless tooth, these are things that you're just trying to stabilize and maintain. So, you know, as a candidate for root coverage, class three and class four, usually not. They're more along the lines of just stabilizing the, the tissues, getting some attachment and just keeping things healthy. So what do we know from what I've said? You know, we see it clinically as tissue recession, but really it's the bone. So there's a famous quote, you know, in implantology and it, and it serves the tissue grafting as well, is that the tissue is the issue, but bone sets the tone. So meaning that what we see in the success of root coverage is mainly based on the bone underneath. So bone is what supports the tissue. Now types of grafts, there's lots of types of grafts nowadays, many categories. You know, we have, in this case, this is a free gingival graft. So this has epithelium on it. This is a subepithelial connective tissue graft. So it, it's removed from an internal layer without the epithelium, which is just connective tissue. This is a de-epithelialized connected tissue graft. So this is a graft that's harvested as a free gingival graft. And then with the blade, we peel off and cut off the epithelium. So uh, these are done usually when I need a lot of graft material and, want, and I want to have a very dense connected tissue graft. There's dermal allograft, so things like dermis or, you know, there's alloderm is probably the most famous one. This is a collagen matrix. This specific image is a uh, fibroguide, but there's other graft materials that are similar to this, mucoderm and, and you know, some 
people use now, Volumax as a memory, but they're basically made out of collagen. It acts like a scaffold where cells can invagine and grow into the site and then slowly turn over into, into tissue. You know, the pinhole procedure itself is based on this where they actually just use collagen membranes to stuff and tent the, the site. And then the goal is that, you know, soft tissue will penetrate and turn over this, this collagen membranes into, into connective tissue. And then also now we, we see some cases where you can use PRF membranes as a, a graph material. So again, there's lots of materials, even, you know, as we go on, there's more and more biomaterials that come out. But what we do know is, you know, no matter what, autogenous tissue is the best. It's still the gold stand, standard. You know, everything that comes out compares itself to autogenous tissue. So, you know, autogenous tissue, and for me, it's very easy to harvest. The way we do it and, and, and what we do afterwards makes it, also very pain free for the patient. So in my practice, you know, if autogenous graft is, is the gold standard, it's the best that we have out there, then it's my number one choice to offer that patient. You know, it's always better. And then if they absolutely refuse, even after I go through telling them, you know, it's not gonna hurt in the way we harvest it, you know, then we'll look into other options. But I always push autogenous grafts. And because of this, probably I would say 90% of my cases are all autogenous tissue. I very rarely use dermal allograph or, or some of the other stuff, biomaterials. And it's interesting, Nahid, can I just jump in really quick? Mm -hmm. So I know a lot of us, when I first started doing grafting, a, a lot of us kind of stuck to like an alloderm just because we were worried or scared. We didn't know how to Thanks, harvest it. Have you seen uh, it five, five years later? It's gone. Absolutely, yeah. right? So I think mm -hmm. this is one thing that I really want the members to understand is you know, not the, to make that same mistake, is to uh, really kind the of- The cool thing is, is unlike alloderm or the dermal allografts, autogenous tissue actually improves with time. Yeah. Like if you look at a free gingival graft, it looks better in five years than it did, you know, six months after. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're excited to hear how you harvest. I'll let you take it over. <laughs> All right. So where I get, you know, the other thing is donor sites, you know, where can we get tissue in the actual, in the mouth, you know, so there's many areas. You can actually get it from the anterior palate. You can get it from the posterior palate. If you just need a free gingival graph, you can also go right down the midline, you know, right where, you know, the midline of the palate, because, you know, you just want a very thin layer of, of keratinized tissue and some connective tissue. So literally a millimeter in thickness is good enough. So there's plenty of places to harvest. Uh, you can harvest from the tuberosity area, as well as sometimes in some patients, you actually have uh, a very thin, thick buccal tissue. So, you know, in some cases you can actually harvest your fusional graft just from some of the buccal tissue that, that's neighboring beside the site. So when we look at our tissue grafts and we look at our layers or our palate, our palate is divided in multiple layers. So starting from the surface, we have epithelium, you have lamina propria and submucosa. The lamina propria is basically the dense fibrous connective tissue. And submucosa is now where you see some of that fatty and glandular tissue. And then below that is your periosteum and bone. Now, the arteries are basically between the periosteum and the submucosa. So they're basically deeper down there. So if you're ever worried, you know, if you need a free gingival graft and you're worried about going too far back or you're, or you're too close to the, the, the actual palatine artery or foramen, you know, a free gingival graft really only has to be one to 1.5 millimeters thick. So you can literally go, and if you harvest it safely with that thickness, you can go all over the palate and harvest it and not to worry. Because remember, always remember the blood vessels are always deeper down just above the bone. And I'll show you where they are too without memorizing numbers. So mo there's a lot of articles, you know, that, that have been published through the years that give you these numbers and they give you all these numbers. This is from the CEJ, basically as you go along the, the teeth to measure from the gingival margin, on average, where are the arteries? But remember, these are average numbers. So meaning that each patient is individually different. You know, I had someone ask me a question once about biologic width and they had tried to do aesthetic crown lengthening and they had inflammation. And they're like, I, I did the three millimeters. I said, you know what? Three millimeters is just a number, it's an average each patient individually has a different amount of biologic width. So you have to see what that patient has. So in cases like this, again, it's nice to memorize the number. It gives you an average, but remember that, you know, when you go into a site, don't think 13 millimeters, I should be safe. I should be safe. You know, that patient may have a shallow palate. It may have a, you know, different anatomy. So 
you have to be careful of these and, and careful of just memorizing numbers like a recipe. Okay, this is the same thing, this same numbers, but now this time they're measuring from the depth of the sulcus. So basically from attached tissue. So now the numbers get a little bit less. Now the trick for these, okay, if you want to be safe, is this is just an image of what actually is underneath. So this is a, an image taken from a textbook that shows the blood vessels. So you can see there's a lot of vascularity in the palate. Okay, you can see also in the midline, there's nothing there. So the midline is pretty safe as long as you stay away from the soft palate to harvest tissue. It's just very uncomfortable, but it's safe. Now, what you have to worry about really is the arteries is thicker towards the posterior. So if you're concerned, as a general rule, we want to stay mesial to the, the mesial line angle of the first molar, and you can go all the way to the centrals. You know, depending on the type of graft you want, I try to avoid the anterior region because of the rugae, but if I'm harvesting a free genital graft, but if I need to, I can go and you can peel it off. But for connective tissue grafts, if you want to be safe, you know, in your beginning, I'll just stay mesial to the mesial line angle of the first molar, and you should, well, for the most part, be in a safe area, okay? Now, this is the slide I wanted to show you guys. So if you look at this closely, you can see where the artery in the vein is in the, in the nerve. They're always at the curve of the arch. So, if, so in a case where you're, you have a patient and you're trying to wonder or guess where the artery is, it's always where the, the palate starts to curve. So if you, you kind of run your finger down the tooth on the palate side and then you start to see it curve to, be, to form the roof of the mouth, at that bend of the curve is usually where the artery is. And a cool trick is if you take your finger with a glove and you start a little bit posteriorly and you put a little bit of pressure, you can actually feel the pulse of the artery. So it's a way to even just locate it and then with slight finger pressure, you'll be able to feel the path through the artery and you'll be able to actually manually palpate the artery itself. So it's a good way to kind of know where it is and then know where your safety zone is. So remember, as a general rule, for me, I always assume that the artery is in the bend of the palate and the curve where it becomes, the wall of the palate becomes the roof of the palate. And again, uh, to check again, I always use my finger and you can actually feel it. So that's a little easy, quick, uh, tip there. Now when we harvest my connective tissue grafts, I usually harvest them with a single incision. We sort of make an incision that's that's uh, perpendicular to the palate, which is the first red line there. And then from that, I do a split thickness incision that sort of goes almost parallel to the bone as I remove the or separate the, the surface layer, the outer flap. And then you can do this two ways. Then once I have that flap opened, we then go in and I can cut out my verticals and then sort of angle the blade internally and do the apical cut. Now, once you do all those cuts, you then have, you know, depending on if it's a thin palate or a thick palate. That's the other thing. Whenever you harvest a graft, when you're giving the anesthesia and you're infiltrating with the needle, use a needle as a guide to see how thick or thin the, the palate tissue is. Because if it's very thin and you're planning on doing a free gingival, I mean, a a connective tissue graft, you may opt to harvest it as a, a free gingival graft and remove the epithelium because you know you want to make sure you have an adequate thick graft. If you try to do it this way with an internal incision and the thickness is very thin, you may not end up with a, a graft at all. You might end up with a very little sliver of tissue. So always know your thickness ahead of time when you're giving anesthesia. So this is just an image. So this is basically, if we sort of go on the upper left side, we make our first incision. It's perpendicular to, to the tissue, to the bone, okay? It goes basically perpendicular to the bone. Once I make that incision, then I turn my blade on a different angle and I now start to go parallel with the flap. And you have to sort of watch as the flap curve that you follow the curve of the flap to make sure that you don't perforate. And that's always done with a, a brand new blade, okay? Because if you have a dull blade, it's not gonna cut, it's gonna tear. So once we make our incision and remove the, the flap layer, which you see in the top middle picture, now we've sort of dissected up and that's a graft. Now what I do is I'll go in and I'll cut my vertical incisions with the blade and then I can, you know, you can see how the flap can be pulled up to expose the tissue. I then make an apical incision and then depending on whether the palate is thick or thin. If it's very thin, then what I do is I just take a periosteal elevator and I just lift the tissue off of the, the bone and just remove it. 
if it's thick, then I can even, instead of lifting the tissue off with the periosteal elevator, I just basically take my blade and I dissect underneath to peel it off. Now, technically, by lifting it right off the bone, it's supposed to be a little bit more uncomfortable than dissecting it out because you're leaving the periosteum there. But to be honest, I haven't found any difference other than maybe, you know, the blood supply is altered when you take the periosteum out. And if your flap on the surface is very thin, then you may get a little bit of necrosis. But to be honest, it doesn't really matter because in a week it'll be all gone. So it's more of just comfort postoperatively. And then, you know, the graft is removed. You can check, you see here in this image, we have a quite a thick graft. Now, how do I close the site? It depends, to be honest, on the site. If it has a lot of bleeding, I do these sutures here, which are like uh, the sort of our mattress sutures that compress the flap down against the bone. So it kind of holds the flap down. And other times I'll do something like this where we'll go and take our tissue and then just do a continuous loop. So it depends on the bleeding and what's going on. You know, sometimes you can also do sutures that actually go from the outside of the tooth and do, they're called cross mattress sutures where they go in, close the flap, and then they go back on the outside. I only do them sometimes. I don't do them all the time because then it leaves knots on the buckle of them and patients complain. But that's another option that works really well too. And then you can see because you, you know, I know where my, my safety zone is, this is a graft taken just like, like I take my connective tissue graft through a single incision. Sometimes you see how I've made a, a vertical. So if you need a little bit more space and it's a smaller, you can always make a vertical, almost like an L-shaped incision to give you a little bit more access to expose the, the flap so that you can get the tissue in and access the apical part of the tissue and, and remove it safely. Here again, because I know where my safety zones are and where the foramen is and where you can palpate, I can easily take a graft all the way back here near the tuberosity region. Now, free gingival grafts. Free gingival, gingival grafts are, are technically, they look scarier, but they're much easier to harvest. They basically, you know, if you don't go too deep, you can pretty much get a free gingival graft from anywhere on the palate. Yeah, and, it's, and you can do it safely. You don't have to really worry about the, the, the arteries as long as you're superficial enough. Now with these, I usually, you know, as a beginner, you, it's easy if you wanna create a tinfoil template or, you know, just to know how large you wanna make your graft and just kind of hold it in the palate and you outline your incisions. Now, the way I do these usually is I'll outline the length and the, the width of my graft. And then I usually start on one side and I just kind of, angle my blade and I slowly start to peel it off. And then the blade is just, as I'm pulling up part of the graft with the forceps, I'm just dissecting and peeling it off almost, you know. And because you start off with an angled incision, I always sometimes will make my graft incisions a little bit larger than what I need. Because what happens is if, when you start to go into those incisions and you split the, the tissue, the edges of the graft will end up getting thinner. They'll almost have like a ramp on it. And, Usually that thin tissue is, is useless sometimes. So always sometimes if you're gonna angle it and, and lose some of the volume and the thickness, make it a little bit longer so that you can compensate for that. Another trick with this is use your blade. Your blade normally, the bevel on the blade is about a millimeter long. So when you're harvesting a fusion of a graft and you're cutting into the depth, you just pretty much cut just to the depth of the bevel on the blade. And this is like an easy way to mark your way along the palate to just be safe. And basically, you can start technically, you can go distally or you can go from the, the mesial or anterior back distally. Doesn't really matter how you do it as long as it's comfortable for you. Sometimes I'll start, you know, going from the coronal portion and splitting it there and then peeling it off from mesial to distal. In this case, we show distal to mesial. So it doesn't really matter as long as whichever way you start it. And then usually with free gingival grafts, I always put something into the donor site. It can be anything, something as simple as a collagen foam. In this case, what we see in the image is Surgicel. Surgicel is really, really good for clotting. It pretty much, you can put it in a little bit of compression with some gauze and it just forms a clot. You know, a lot of times I'll put Surgicel and then just put some stitches over this, or even I just put the Surgicel, let it clot, and then I just drip some tissue glue over it you know, some cyanoacrylate, and it just holds it in, in, in place. And by the time it breaks down and peels off, the site is already epithelialized and there's no problem. 
the other thing in this case is this patient actually had a denture. So we just put the surgery cells on tissue glue and just had them wear the denture over it. So you can actually make an acrylic template or like a retainer that can seat and just protect the graft site if, if it, you have a larger graft and it just makes it a little bit more comfortable. Sometimes you can also put PRF membranes into the site and put some stitches over it to hold it in. And they will also work well with hemostasis and you know, making it a little bit more comfortable. This is a tuberosity. So tuberosity is a very nice place to get a very dense, thick, fibrous tissue. If you're grafting or you're doing any root coverage for anterior cases, I would stay away from tuberosity tissue, especially on the buckle. For implants, you can use it in and around the, the, the coronal portion as well as to create papilla, but not on the buckle because tuberosity tissue has been shown to create some sort of hypertrophic reaction over time and it can actually kind of grow like a growth and you'll have to keep on trimming it. So if you're going to use tuberosity tissue, don't use it for recession on an anterior tooth in the aesthetic zone. Okay, but same thing, this is just a nice thick chunk of connective tissue that some people really have. Uh, really good thick tuberosities that you don't even need to go anywhere else in the palate, especially for just you know treating some recession. So the way it's taken is, you know, you can make a V-shaped incision, or you can make an incision and sort of peel back the flaps and then take a larger piece from underneath. And once it's removed, it almost comes out like a wedge. So if you see here, I just make my two parallel incisions, and then I kind of change my angle depending on how large or how thick. I want my graft and the graft is just pulled out and cut out. Once it's cut out, this is one piece of tuberosity, which I then use the blade to cut into two pieces. So you get a lot of graft material out of this one little site. And then usually two little interrupted sutures to just close up the wound and the patient hardly feels anything. So it's a nice place to get tissue without causing any discomfort. Now here, the same thing. This is another tuberosity tissue. This is just a chunk right off the top. And then the, the two images on the right are basically the epithelium removed off the top. And so again, this is you know really nice for using as a graft material to create papillas actually. Here's another thing, a wedge of uh, connective tissue from the tuberosity, and then the epithelium is just peeled or cut right off and you have a nice big wedge. So these are actually nice because of their fi fibrous nature. They're good for building tissue near the papilla around there, especially around implants, because they tend to plump up really nicely during the healing. And over the years, they actually mature really well and fill those voids nicely. And then this is the last uh, note that I said as a harvesting site. You know, in cases where you have a thick band of keratinized tissue, literally you can actually gain tissue just from the neighboring site. So in this case, you know, we're gonna be treating this, uh, looks like a 3-1 where you can see there's also right at the three one, there's no keratinized tissue and just mucosa. So we just took a piece of graft from the neighboring tooth and just transplanted it as a mini free of graft. And you know, you gain a nice band of tissue. So in some cases, especially, you know, sometimes in the maxilla, in the posterior area, sometimes in lower anteriors, if they have really thick bands of keratinized tissue, they can also be used as harvest site to, as donor tissue. So our tissue itself, you know, like I said, we want to keep it very thin. You don't really want any of that glandular or fatty tissue. We want to have, you know, if, depending on if it's a free genital graft, the epithelium. And if it's just root covered, we just want the connective tissue. So you can see from this graft, you don't need a lot of thickness in your tissue. You know, and also with connective tissue grafts, orientation doesn't matter. You know, once you harvest it, you can put the periosteum side against the the root surface or you can flip it and put the, the, the surface, the tissue side on it. It doesn't really matter, both really work the same way. Graft thickness, again, I mentioned this before. The ideally, you want it between one to 1.5 millimeters. You don't want it more than two. And this has to do with the fact that the graft itself has to regain vascularity. So if it's, if it's too thin, it doesn't gain enough blood supply soon enough and it ends up necrosing. If it's too thick, a lot of that volume is lost because of the fact that it takes too long for the vascular the blood vessels to grow into the graft so you know sometimes we always think oh a big thicker graft is is needed it's not always needed so from the different techniques and the types of grafts you know we know that free genital graft is our gold standard for increasing creatinized tissue if your goal for any case is to increase the band of creatinized tissue then 
free digital graphs is the way to go. You know, don't bother with a uh, connect tissue graph if you want a nice tissue, whether it's around an implant or uh, just for a tooth. A free digital graph is just the most predictable and the best way to do it. And then likewise, if you're looking to get root coverage, then a connected tissue graft is what you want to use with a coronal position flap. You know, nothing works better, looks better than, than a connected tissue graft with a coronal position flap. So some of the instruments I use, uh, whenever you do tissue grafting, tissue grafting is, you need to have a lot of fine motor skills. So with this, if you're going to do tissue grafting, I would invest in some good instruments. You need to have a really good needle holder and good forceps. And, you know, if you just have crappy material instruments, it's just going to become so much harder because uh, grafting itself has to be very fine. And so you need to have a good quality needle holder, a good quality forceps to be able to control the, the sutures and control everything easily. When you have cheap instruments, it just makes it harder for you. The other thing is sometimes when you have a, you know, and if you have a chance, you know, like for example, hold a Hugh Freedy brand needle holder that may be, you know, three, four hundred dollars and hold it and compare it to one of the $80 ones and you'll see the difference. And, you know, with these things, I am very picky with my instruments. So I don't, I'm not, uh, I don't look for value and savings when I'm buying my instruments because I know that the, the crap you're in the cheaper instruments will make me waste more time when I'm actually working. So from a productive hourly point of view, you know, you get your money back when you use nice instruments because it's less of a hassle when you're working. The main things is, you know, for tissue grafts is have a nice tissue forcep and a nice needle holder. Some of these, the, uh, the ones I just showed were from Hugh Freedy. Uh, it's a special microsurgical kit. These ones you can get from Denmat actually. These are, uh, uh, I forgot the brand, but they're in the Denmat book. They're part of their microsurgical instrument kit. So it's in the it's in their catalog. I think they're the Shanelac instruments. Is is under Dennis Shanelac's microsurgical instruments. Okay. And then sutures. I mean, when we work and I use sutures, remember tissue has blood supply so if you use a you know a larger needle and a larger suture gauge then you're disrupting more of the blood supply so you want to make sure that when using sutures you're using something that's you know i like to use monofilament sutures because they're they're not braided they don't cause inflammation things heal much nicer and much faster as well as certain gauges uh if you're not good at suturing then don't start off with like a, a six so you can have a lot of problems you know it requires a little bit more finesse and skill to use a six so gauge but five oh you know would be something you want to start with so the other thing is if you're going to start doing tissue grafts make sure that your your suturing skills are are, are up to par because you know if you can't suture the site well it, it'll just make the whole thing fail Okay, blades wise for grafting, I use a 15C, a 15 blade. For grafting, for harvesting grafts, I like to use a 15 blade. And then sometimes for tuberosities, a, a 12V or 12. And then for working around the teeth, we I like to use a 15C blade, sometimes a 12. Sometimes I use these micro blades. This is an ophthalmic blade that is very nice for making small little tunnels and small little incisions. It is very minimally invasive, but it's very sharp and it worked really well for small areas, especially, you know, this is a really nice one. This one and this one here are really nice for doing lingual grafts on lower end tiers where I just need to have, you know, a certain angle. And because they're bendable, they work really well, especially when you're you know, visual, you can't see the site as well and you're working from a, a difficult angle. Uh, these come really in, in handy. And this is just another type of a micro blade. This is, this is, uh, comes from microsurgery. It's actually a small piece of a razor blade that you break off and then you use this blade clamp. It's like a blade beaker that holds the, and clamps down on the piece of the, the, the blade and then it, it, you tighten it and it holds it in place and it can be used to make small micro incisions. Sutures we mentioned, again, the smaller gauge, the better. Uh, in general, I personally, for tissue grafting, will use between six and seven O's. I don't go, I don't go smaller than that unless it's something very tiny, but six O's and seven O's are, are good enough. Uh, as you're starting out, you can use five O's, but, and then sort of 
as you come up and you get better with your suturing and, and you have a little bit more manual dexterity, then you can graduate up to the six O's and seven O's. For tunneling uh, types of cases, I have I use tunneling instruments. These are some of the tunneling instruments I use. Uh, they're all different angles and shapes to kind of get into all different types of sites and, and different anatomies. Here's just a close-up view. These are just used to you know push through the sulcus and and basically strip the tissue off the bone, allowing you to create a pouch or a pocket within the site. These are the first one is an Orban knife. This is used to sort of internally release and dissect the, the tissue to allow coronal positioning. And the, the other instrument on the right is called, a, it's a interdental knife. Basically, this just slides into the sulcus down to the bone to sort of start to lift the, the pillow. And I start, I use these to start to create my tunnels. With. So we're gonna go through some cases. I'm gonna start with a basic, uh, free gingival graft case. This is actually a really old case. I think it was when I was a resident. So free gingival grafts. Number one, you know, I call them on leg grafts because they sit sort of on top of the surface of a recipient bed. There's no flap that goes over them. Now on leg grafts or, or free grafts in a sense only receive their blood supply from the base. So you have to make sure that when you do these, the suturing and the compression and the dead space is all removed so that there's no interruption in the blood supply. Now, what most people don't know is that free gingival grafts or on-leg grafts can be either connective tissue grafts or free gingival grafts. They both work the same way because the, the genetic component to making keratinized tissue is in the connective tissue, not in the epithelium. So indications for these free on-leg grafts are obviously number one is to gain a band of wider keratinized tissue to improve thickness and uh, tissue thickness and stabilize the bone levels as well as a good way to increase vestibular depth when you need it. So here we go. Here's our first case. If you look at the site, you can see a little bit of bone loss. You can see some mucogenival defects or lack of keratinized tissue in some areas. And if you pull a little bit, you can see the vestibule almost attaches at the gingival margin a little bit. So whenever we start these, we want to create a recipient bed. Okay, because these are only grafts. They only get their blood supply from the actual base. So what I do is I sort of outline with a horizontal incision first, and then two little mini vertical incisions to create my incision design. And then what I do is I, I sort of angle my blade and I sort of peel off a little corner, and then I just do a very slow, sharp dissection with sweeping movements to be able to remove the, the surface flap, but still leave periosteum at the, at the base or underneath the bone. So this is slowly, we just go in and we peel everything out. Now, sometimes, I just cut the, the excess tissue out. You don't always need it. Sometimes I just apically position in suture. In this case, it looks like I cut it out because my goal here was just to gain a band of creatinine tissue. I didn't need any of those papillas because they would just be harder to just stitch close. So now that we've created a split thickness bed, you can see the periosteum over the, the tissue and over the bone. So the bone is not exposed completely. You always leave the periosteum there. I used a tinfoil template to measure the size of my graft. The template was then used in the palette to create a guide for my incisions. This is the same case that I showed you earlier. We take out the graft. Surgery cell is placed in. This woman had a complete denture, so we weren't worried about that. We just had her wear her denture. The graft is just positioned into the site, and you sort of Sometimes I'll sort of flip it around and see which way it fits the best, thin it out if it needs to be or adjust it during this time to make sure it seats well. Then what we do is I usually just take some moist gauze and I just, a little bit of finger pressure, I just compress it down and just hold it for a few seconds. And that compression will just create a little bit of a mild clot which will hold it in place to where I want it. And it also removes any air or dead space. Once I do that, then I start to make my inner proximal stitches, just inter simple interrupted just along each papilla in sight, just to hold where I want it to be. Once I do that, then I use some horizontal cr cross mattresses, as well as a, a horizontal suture just to hold it in place. And these, what these sutures do is just compress the graft down against the recipient bed and basically push it against its blood supply. So it removes any mobility of the graft, it removes any airspace, and it makes sure that that graft is pressed against the recipient bed where it's going to get its blood supply. And then usually at sometimes 
you know, I'll suture the, the apical tissue down below, not to the graft, but below in the periosteum to hold it in there. And basically once it heals, this is what it looked like. So our goal here again wasn't root coverage, it was just to gain a band of creatinized tissue to just keep the site uh, healthy and to make sure that these teeth stay stable and healthy. So in this case, you know, it, it's pretty predictable. And as long as you follow these steps, it's very easy to get this. And you know, it's not really hard at all. You know, main, one of the key things is just keep the graft in place and make sure that there's no air pockets or air bubbles underneath the graft between the, the base and the graft. Here's another case, similar concept. This is more of a, you can see this is a newer case. My photography is better. Same concept, you know, we're doing a free genome graft. Here's my graft harvested. The graft is stabilized and sutured in place against the recipient bed. Here you can see that I've sutured the actual apical part of the flap down into the periosteum to just create that vestibular depth. And again, here my goal was just to get a nice band of creatinized tissue. This is at two weeks where we remove the stitches and see how things are healing. Everything looks nice and pink. So I know that the graft is surviving. We're getting blood supply. And this is once it's matured. So now we have a nice thick band of tissue. This case, the guy, when he came originally, he, he had bone loss. You know, you can see the loss of a pillow. So I told him that, you know, you're, and he was just worried about, he was sent because they're worried about uh, losing his lower teeth. And I, you know, to be honest, when you have horizontal bone loss, you can't do much about the bone other than just make sure the tissue is thick and healthy around it to preserve the bone. And so that's what we decided in this case to do a free genome graft to thicken the tissue and the creatinized tissue around the ear so that we basically prevent plaque accumulation, you prevent inflammation from there because you have thicker horizontal fibers attached to the bone. It just makes an overall healthy environment and it protects the bone. You know, when you have thicker tissue like this, you know, studies have shown that you get less bone loss over time. You know, so it, it preserves and protects the bone and keeps the prognosis for these teeth much, much better. And Nahid, just a quick question for you, buddy. Yeah. Um, that suturing, uh, just a couple of quick questions. Uh, is it, why is it not advisable just to suture that apical portion of the graft? I know I saw sometimes oh. you do, sometimes you don't. Like, uh, you mean the, the flap itself or the yeah. graft? Yeah, the flap. The only time I don't, I Oh, sorry, don't. the graft, the graft, sorry. Yeah. The graft? Oh, because, uh, the sutures themselves compress the graft, so there's no need for me to suture the apical portion. I usually suture them sort of mesiodistally and then in approximately the papillas. And then the mattress sutures or these sutures themselves compress the graft from an apical point. So it's okay. not needed, but if you do it, it's not a bad thing. It's just less work. Everybody's kind of looking at that suturing like, what the hell is that? <laughs> yeah, uh, about this suture, this is a suture of my own design. Uh, I'm getting a friend to do the illustrations for this and we'll publish it. Okay. But yeah, it's this is an advanced suture. I figured. It, okay. It's not needed. It just looks pretty. Uh, I wouldn't worry about it too much unless you're good at suturing. It's very hard to do. Okay. But it looks nice for pictures. So another case here. Now the same thing here. You can look at the case here. You can see the, the bone loss, uh, lack of creatinized tissue. You know, when you look at an x-ray, this tooth has probably about 50% bone loss. So with cases like this, I don't attempt to do root coverage. It just, it's useless. You know, root coverage here, I, I will promise the patient something I can't deliver. So again, these are pre-genital grafts or, or our goal here is to gain more creatinized tissue. Now in this case, instead of using a, a free genital graft, I used a connect, connective tissue graft. So same thing, we create our split thickness bed, okay? Always making sure it's split thickness because you want to leave periosteum on the bone because if you expose bone, you will get bone loss and it's also more painful. This is our connected tissue graft, just aligned in there so we can sort of adjust and make sure that it fits in seats. This is my this graft sutured. Here I sutured the apical portion of the flap into the periosteum. Uh, this looks like it's interrupted sutures. Now this is an older case of mine, so you can see these are 5-0 proline sutures. Now I would use 6-0. But you can see, even with the connected tissue graft, it heals. This is at two weeks, I removed the stitches. You can see how nicely it heals. And this is once it's mature. So when you look at this and this, you can see that, you know, if you have someone who's worried about pain or discomfort, you can always technically use a connective tissue graft and trim and adjust it and use it like a free genital graft. And you'll still get the same amount of creatinized tissue. Okay. The only thing I find with connective tissue grafts is you have to make them a, 
keep them thicker because they tend to shrink more than, than free gingival grafts with the epithelium. But apart from that, you get the same results as you can see here, plenty of cretinized tissue. And it doesn't look that bad aesthetically too. Here's another case. This is, I used connective tissue in as a free digital graft approach. But again, here, just one thing to note is look how small my connective tissue graft is in some areas. And you'll see as it heals, I didn't get as much thicker cretinized tissue because of the, the thinness of my connective tissue in some areas, but we still have attached cretinized tissue. So that's what our goal was. But keep in mind, again, if you're gonna use connective tissue, make sure that it's, it's a little bit thicker than normal and wider for these cases when you're gonna use it like an only graft, mainly because of the shrinkage. Now, only grafts like this, again, can be used mainly as well for implants, you know, because remember, if you have thicker, wider band of attached keratinized tissue, it's going to make plaque control easier. It's going to make sure that you have less effects of inflammation on the site and overall making it easier to maintain and stay healthy. So in this case, this was a, a case that came in, uh, the, the GP referred him for just the fact that she, so this lady, if you can see that redness around the, t the area, so she has uh, uh, lichen planus. So the lichen planus would flare up and it would, it would make it difficult for her to clean the area. And you can also see that frenal pull on the margin of the first implant. So with the lichen planus and the frenal pull, you know, we're getting a lot of plaque accumulation. So, and she didn't have much cretinized tissue in the area there. So we decided to, again, do a free genome graft, taken as a strip, sutured in place. We cleaned up the implants as well. Usually we clean everything up and uh, clean the surface of the implants that are exposed. My goal is not to really cover any of that implant collar there. I just, we just want a band of cretinized tissue, so I don't actually do anything to the exposed metal there. And this is just how it's healed. And you can see again, so now going from what we have before, we have a nice thick band of attached cretinized tissue, which will make it, and you can see the frenal pull is totally gone now. So this will keep the implants a little bit more stable and, and make it easier for her to clean despite the, the light complainness. Another case, this lady, she was a, a, an older lady. She was probably, I think, in her mid to high 70s. They referred her here. You know, the goal here was to just salvage the implant. She was just too old to have her go through major surgery to remove that implant, do some bone augmentation, rebuild the site and restore with new implants. So our goal here was just to stabilize this site, make it more cleansable and keep this implant healthy, you know, pretty much for the rest of her life. So again, all we did was a free gingival graft. Okay, we cleaned the surface of the area. I removed all the, the frenal pools. I created a split thickness bed, cleaned everything out and did a nice free gingival graft across everything. And you can see how now the difference between what she started with and what she's you know what she ended up with and you can see the tissue is nice and pink it's healthy it's easier for her she can now brush directly onto the area whereas before she was feeling a lot of discomfort and pain because of the freno poles and the attachment and, and all the scar tissue there so you know free genome grafts in this case can be used to to basically save the implant in a sense now this case this is a case that was post bone augmentation uh, because of the way things were pulled towards the palate, the mucogingival junction, the vestibule was sort of gone. And so here we used a free gingival graft. Okay, just you can see, basically it was harvested just from the palatal side of that, that site. And we just transplanted it on the buckle. Uh, I sutured the flap apically because here you can see I wanted to recreate a vestibule. And so I didn't want that flap to come back down and reattach and we lose our vestibule. We wanted to keep a nice open wide vestibule. And then the free gingival graft was sutured over it to make sure that now we also get a nice band of nice tissue. And this is again, that fancy suturing I did. You know, we have yet to name it, but it looks like a fishnet to me. And then this is how the site heals. So we go from basically no vestibule with mucosa attaching onto the actual occlusal surface of the ridge to now a nice thick amount of adequate tissue. Now this case was, so the re, normally I do this when I place the implant, but in this case, this was someone who, uh, one of my referrals who does their own implants. So they just referred it for the augmentation and they just like it, you know, they like to do their implants guided. So they're like, just make everything perfect. Get the tissues perfect. So all I have to do is just pop on the guide and place the implants. 
So in this case, we basically did the grafting and got it all ready for him. You can see we had you know a large amount of bone. Now you can see the ridge width, and the vestibule is good. So now he can easily just do a nice flapless approach guided surgery case. It makes his life easier. So the next type of graft I'll talk about is coronally positioned flaps. So when I do grafts for root coverage, they usually fall in into three main categories. One is a coronally positioned flap where we make incisions, sulcular incisions and position the flap coronally with uh, a tissue graft. The other is where we do a lateral sliding flap where rather than positioning something too far apically, we just slide it over. And then the last one mainly is tunneling. So coronally positioned flaps, they can be done with connective tissue, they can be done if the tissue is thick enough alone, just the flap alone, or they can be done with some sort of dermal allograft or uh, collagen matrix. So these are mainly used for root coverage, but they also improve tissue thickness, healthy for the bone, improve aesthetics and root sensitivity. Okay, so here's a case, a uh, patient came in, they just didn't like the way the teeth look. This is more of an aesthetic issue. You know, but what I see is, you know, minimal keratinized tissue. I see restorations that were used to class five restorations that were used to, I guess, seal up maybe root sensitivity due to the recession. So, you know, cases like this, guys, if you do it, it always offer a, a root coverage procedure first before you do this, because most of the time these just get worse and worse over the years. And then it's harder to fix. So in this case, in order to fix this, we had to go in, we created a flap. Now, Usually I do flaps when I have to access the bone or do something to the root surface because through tunneling, you know, although I love tunneling, tunneling it's harder to gain access to the bone and do some of these things. So here I went in, we removed some of the restorations. I usually remove them to the level of where I think I'm gonna get the tissue at. We put a connected tissue graft over the site and then coronally position the flap. And this is how it all healed up and matured. So you go from basically before to after, she's quite happy with it. She didn't have to do any other restorative work. This is just basically how the tissues healed. I had told her you may have to re replace or adjust some of the fillings afterwards, but it ended up turning out pretty decent and she was happy with the result and she didn't want to do anything. And it, you know, in my opinion, it looked pretty good. So I was happy too. Another case, sometimes, you know, when you have very long narrow defects or long recession defects, sometimes tunneling is hard because it's hard to tunnel that much tissue coronally without causing bubbling or folding or bunging up of the papilla. So in these cases like this, we can reposition and uh, basically coronal position the flap with connective tissue. Here we used a, a Zucchelli type of approach where we make some oblique incisions to compensate for the, the way we're gonna reposition the tissue. A small connective tissue graft. Again, you can notice here, I don't need a huge graft. It doesn't need to be long, just enough to be able to cover the root and sutured, the graft is sutured basically to the papillary tissue in between the teeth. And then the flap is currently positioned with sling suture. And then this is just how it is at two weeks mark. And then once it's matured. Now, if you look at this tooth, he will likely, I, I told him before, because when you look at the before, these are like abfraction lesions with abrasion and toothbrushing that has caused these. And part of the CEG has been worn away. So I mentioned that once I treat this, there will be these little edges that you'll have to go and restore with your restorative dentist to be able to finalize it. Because where the notching is, it's more coronal and it's past the CEG. And in order to make that tooth look a little bit more natural, you'll have to fill in. So that's why you see some of that notching there, you see. So that will be restored with the class five restoration. Here's another case, same concept. Again, this is a little bit of abfraction and wear toothbrush trauma. So if you look closely, a lot of these CEGs have been, have been worn right off. And so normally I usually tell the dentist or the restorative doctor that, go ahead and restore the class five to where the ideal CEJ is first and then send them for grafting. Sometimes they just like me to do this first and they'll treat it depending on where it ends up. But usually it's easier for them actually to do it at this point because they have access to, once I do the graft, they're literally then working around the margins. They don't have much space. But in this case, they wanted me to do it first, which is fine. So we went in, we did the same concept like before, currently position flap. And this is the results afterwards. So now he's ready to go see the dentist to finalize and touch up and recontour some of those restorations and add some restoration to make it look a little bit more aesthetic. 
Again, same thing, even we treat lingual recessions, you know, in this case, uh, they can be done usually, I usually do it either by a coronally positioned flap with connected tissue or a tunneling approach. In this case, we use a coronally positioned flap with connected tissue graft, release the flap, sling it, close up the site, and you know, we get a nice heal result. So very predictable. Again, when I look at these cases, I always look at the interproximal bone loss. So everything is healed nice and looks predictable. And these are more of a pain to actually treat because of the way it looks. Uh, Nahid, just a quick question for you, buddy. Mm -hmm. um, that, uh, um, the tissue that's into that cervical lesion, did you have to recontour the tooth at all to ensure that there was no concavity? A lot of these abstraction lesions, are you, what are you Some, doing? Yeah, so sometimes when I lift the flap, if there's notching, I'll flatten and smoothen the root where I'm going to do the graft where they're like, if I plan to cover the graft to the, the margin, then I'll recontour it. But if they're going to be treating it restoratively, then I don't really bother because I know the graft is not going to currently position that far. But usually if I don't do it, then when they're doing the class five restoration, they can recontour it. Or if they think they don't need it, they can just reshape it. Perfect. Thanks. But yeah, if I'm planning to get the root, the flap to that point, then yeah, I will actually bevel and reshape it to have it more of a, a smooth transition rather than a notch. Another case, again, chromic position flap. You can notice here the key, is the, the free node pole. We have our tissue graft, again, connects the tissue graft. The graft is tucked in, chromic position flap. I'm not showing all the details because I want to go through a lot of cases and I've been put on a time limit. So don't worry if you have, you know, I'm skipping some of the pictures, but it's just the same concept. The graft is sutured, the flap is currently positioned, and this is a result. Okay, and I want you to notice where the frenum is from the before and after. So when we release the flap, you can actually release the level of the frenum and put it more apically without having to really cut it from the outside. And what it is, it's just a periosteal release. I do it over that freedom so that it stretches and then it ends up being positioned more apically. Laterally positioned flap. So this is the same, our goals are the same, but uh, again, this is a flap that goes, comes from the side. And most of the time I do this when there's a large amount of recession and you have a nice thick band of cretinized tissue neighboring. And if I were to do a currently positioned flap, like in a case like this, I'd get too much, either I'd reduce the vestibule a lot or there'd be too much bu bu uh, bunching up or, you know, so this is where using a lateral sliding flap works a lot better. In this case, the rooted surface is cleaned and smoothened. I then create my lateral flap. So you can see the curvature of my flap. So the curve over the lateral is sort of the shape of how I want it to sit over the actual central here. We take, you know, this is just a flap taken off laterally and then we're just checking to see how it releases and make sure that you know with these you have to make sure there's adequate release because you're pulling it from one side to the other so there is some tension there that you have to make sure it's totally eliminated our connected tissue graft is then sort of sutured and tunneled in position and the flap is currently uh, laterally slid and sutured in place the only thing i don't like about these is because of all the incisions it has a lot of scar tissue sometimes but usually over time, it, it sort of slowly mold, disappears. You know, this was just not too long after the actual surgery. This was probably at like a month to maybe six weeks. This over time will naturally just uh, get, uh, you know, it will naturally get its, you know, maturity and the graft will look, the tissue will kind of blend in a little bit more. I wanted him to come back, but he, you know, most of these guys, they just kind of disappear once they leave. But again, it's, you know, I would have probably to make this look a little bit better, either giving it more time or maybe taking a diamond bird to just smoothen out some of those tissue and those incisions. But he was happy with it. You know, all he saw was root and he just wanted the root covered. So someone who doesn't have a high smile line, they don't care about these things. Same concept here. We just see as a lower incisor. We took some tissue laterally and sutured our connective tissue over it and then slid our graft and our flap to cover this, the defect. And sometimes you can actually stretch the flap to cover the entire site, like in this case. And this is how it matured. So you can see the before and after. So you end up sometimes getting a pretty decent result. You can see again, a little bit of mild, I'm picky, so I look at these little ledging and things, but patients don't care. 
But again, this is one of the drawbacks of these. You're making a lot of incisions, so you do get these indentations and scarring sometimes. So tunneling approach. So tunneling is my favorite way to treat a graft because when I treat the site, I want to make sure that it's it doesn't look like anything was done. You know, I'd like to have it look like, you know, no one can tell a graft was done. So again, here's a site. You can see a little bit of recession there. Simple class one case. You know, we clean the root surface. I use usually scalers and chisels sometimes. I use an interdental knife to start off my, my intracellular incision down to the bone. Then we use our tunneling instruments to slide in and start to create our pouch. Our connective tissue graft is harvested, shaped to fill the site. And then we just make sure that we get adequate flap release so that we can currently position the flap. This is the orban knife, that, it's a half orban that goes in and dissects the tissues allowing the currently positioned flap without tension. Just another view. And then the graft is slowly tucked in. I usually slide it into one side with sutures and then I tuck it into the other side so that it's positioned. Once the graft is positioned, then I just use sling sutures to hold and currently position the flap. And usually in two weeks, this is what it looks like. So I want you to note that these are proline sutures. Look how nice the site, the inflammation, how everything heals so fast. And this is just a two week post-op. So you can see that, you know, because of the monofilament, the lack of any inflammation and good hygiene, things mature really fast and really nicely. And, you know, this is just once it's matured. We actually noticed that we're getting more creeping of the tissue once it, it fully matured. And like, so she, this lady was actually prone to getting cleoids. And so I, I'm assuming that because of her tendency to get cleoids, this is why the tissue is kind of staying thick and kind of creeping up. But again, she didn't mind it. You know, I told her if it, it starts to grow more, we can always thin it out. Here's another case. Again, most of my anterior cases, if I can, I always use tunneling. The, the interdental knife used to start our tunnel our tunneling spoons. Here I use, in some cases, I can also use this ophthalmic blade to go in and dissect out the, the flap underneath to make sure it's fully released. Our graft is done. This is, I think, 7 sutures actually. So our graft is tucked into the tunnel and sutured in place. So here you can see the sutures actually hold the, the graft where we want it to be. And then with little slings, the graft is currently positioned with the flap. And this is at two weeks post-op. So you can see even with a smaller gauge suture, a 7 the tissue even heals even nicer. So less interruption of the blood supply. And this is how it's matured. So this is after a few weeks or a few months, I think. So we started off like this and we ended up like this. So sometimes, you know, when you look at this, it's hard to tell. There's no scarring, there's no incisions. It, it looks much more natural than some of the other procedures. Another case here, same thing, recession. You can see the frenal pull, minimal attached tissues, connective tissue graft. Just site, you know, place into the site to measure. It's tucked into the, the tunnel and sutured. And here I used, if you can see clearly, there's some apical mattress sutures there. Sometimes when I have some tension or a frenum there and I want to make sure that the graft stays where we do it. I do these apical mattress sutures to hold them into position, it sort of holds the graft currently and releases some of the tension from the margin. So it works to get a little bit more support and prevents a little bit of retraction during the healing. So this is the post-op once it's all matured. So we started like this and this is how it ends. Again, notice where the frenum was almost at the margin of that premolar and look at it where it is after the graft has been treated. So you can see how it can be displaced apically. The tissue is nice and thick around the, the teeth. Uh, root coverage has been gained and looks much, much better. Sometimes we get cases like this where they've had old restorative work and you know you start to get recession and you know it's really evident when you have especially restorative work because you can see the transition between the porcelain and the root surface it, it just doesn't look aesthetic so we get cases like this same thing we measure our graft the graft is tucked into the tunnel and sutured in place and this is how it matures so you can see that now you know the before and after the bridge looks much much nicer now or the crown sorry
and you could see the thickness of the tissue as well, which is good, especially whenever you have any type of restorative margin, always make sure that you have nice, thick, adequate attached keratinized tissue to make sure that you don't get any future recession and to keep the margin healthy. Here's a lower anterior case. Now here you can see the frenum is attached right onto the gingival margin. So whenever this is the case, the gingival margin, it, you know, we need to release that pull. So sometimes I create my tunnels, measure our graftin, secure the graft, position it, and then I do an apical incision. So you can see I have an apical mattress suture to hold the graft in place, and then below that, or apical to that, I make a small incision just to release the vestibule and the tension on the flap. So it basically allows me to create a vestibule of attached tissue and then release that pull because of the fact that that frenal attachment was right almost at the margin. So this takes away tension as well from the site. And this is how it looks at two weeks. And so this is the after. So when you look at the before and after, you can hardly tell that anything was treated. You can see where the, the teeth are. And actually, now that I look at this picture, it looks like we also had some movement of the teeth because I see a gap before and after there's no gap. I wonder if she's wearing a retainer. I think she's wearing a retainer because it looks like some ortho treatment has been done. But again, when you look at the, the, the post, uh, it's hard to tell that any, anything was done. You know, you can see the vestibule has been created. All of that frenal pull and attachment is totally gone. On the other case, same thing, thin tissue. You can see a light frenal pull. The recession is because it's created a ledge. The tooth is sort of tilted buckly. It's creating a plaque trap. You can see the mild inflammation there. You get a nice thick connective tissue graft. The, the connective tissue graft is measured around the site. It's slid into the tunnel and positioned sutured in place with slings and you can see the before and after okay so now the site has been healed you have nice thicker tissue around there you don't see the prominence of the roots and it's a much better you know result and environment now to, for stability here's another tunneling case again these are teeth obviously you can see that one of the factors causing the recession is the the buckle positioning of the teeth you can see they're pretty much outside of the bone and because of their position this is what's caused the recession in this case, I told the lady that, listen, I can treat it. It may look good, but it's likely going to retract unless you consider orthodontic treatment. And uh, she said, yeah, it's okay. I understand the risk. I'm not going to go through braces. And we did the graft. So the graft is tunneled, secured. We had sutures in, in place, sling sutures and apical mattress because of the positioning of the, the teeth. And this is the post office. And then this was actually three years post-op. She came back because she needed an implant as well. And she said, look, he told me that it's going to recede. It's three years now and it's still going well. So this is a three-year post-op picture. So you can see that, you know, there is stability. Things look good. Everything's healthy. And, you know, sometimes it's hard to tell again that we did any grafting if no one knew. And Nahid, can you just go back to that, uh, how you kind of pull that um, graft into the site with those sutures? Is that something that's easily explained or... So basically what I do is I'll start with one side. I go into the, into the tissue from the outside and then I come out of the, the sulcus. So it sort of needle goes into the buckle, comes out of the sulcus internally from, from the flap. I grab a, a corner of the graft and then I go back into the sulcus and then come out the same place I came in. And then I don't tie it. What I do is I, I sort of use the sutures to pull on the graft and it pulls it into the tunnel. And then once I have one side, then I do the same thing for the other side. And then I kind of use this, the threads to kind of hold it in position. And then once I have it, then I'll tie each end. It's called a purse string suture. There's Perfect. another case where you might be able to get the idea a little bit better. Thanks. But usually it's a way to secure the graft in position without worrying about it floating around once you stuff it in. Sometimes, you know, people like to just stuff it in and use a sling suture with the flap and the graft. This way you're sort of getting a double layer and, and you know, ensuring that the graft, even if something breaks on the sling, it's not going to slide away. Same case here, again, an aesthetic area. You can see, look at the, the canine, the one three, the one two, a little bit on the one one, and especially the two two and the two three. So the two two is like the main one that looks bad. So we took some graft material, cut it into half, measured both sites place them into the site, sling sutures again, and this is the post-op. If you look at the before and after, it looks good. You can see the, the, the 
large improvement in the tissue on the two two looks much much better but also the one the one three the one two one one two 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 three they all look much much better and you see the tunnel because we use tunneling again it's hard to tell that anything was done you know if this patient came into your office and he never said anything you probably wouldn't be able to tell that he did or had any grafting done which is what our goal is and which is one of the benefits of tunneling same thing, this young girl, this actually young girl in her early 20s came in. She didn't like the fact that when she smiled, you could see gum tissue on one side of her smile and, and you could see the teeth going right to the lip line on the other because of the amount of recession. So same thing, we did a connected tissue graft through a tunnel approach, stuffed it in, sling sutures. This is at two weeks post-op and this is how the site matured. So you can see the before and after. A nice improvement. She was very happy with the results. Now when she smiles, you can see gums on both sides. So she was quite happy. And, and again, so like I said, for most of my anterior aesthetic cases, I try to tunnel as much as possible just because you just can't beat the, the aesthetic results. You know, whereas if I had to make an incision, you know, there's the risk of scarring or incision lines showing. Sometimes you get clefting or ledging, but with tunnels, it just, you know, looks really, really nice. Now here's a case, uh, some dentists, you know, I talked to don't even know that we can do this. So remember, whenever you have connective tissue, connective tissue can attach on cementum. So a case like this, when they come in, you know, even though there's decay, you don't need to put a restoration there. So what we did here was she actually came to see me first. She came because she had, she was worried about the gums and then I referred her to a dentist once we took care of her. So a uh, case like this, what I do is I remove the decay first. And you know, as long as the decay doesn't go into the nerve, you're okay. So what we did was I removed the decay. Okay, and luckily the root decay wasn't too, too deep. So I was able to remove it without getting into the nerve. I then sh sometimes will bevel and reshape the tooth, create my tunnel, take my connective tissue graft, stuff it into the tunnel and currently position everything as high as I can. Remember I mentioned that we sort of overcompensate. And so here I overcompensate as high as, I can go coronally with my slings. And then this is how it matures. So now the graft is healed. The, the margin is much more natural. And now she's gonna go see the restorative dentist to take care of the rest of the decay. And so we started with something like this and we end up like this. So you can see that a lot of people, I get a lot of people sometimes, you know, who don't realize like if you see this and you're about to crown the tooth, don't, don't make a crown like this. You know, send it to one of us or if you can do it yourself, remove, graft the root then once it matures then do your crown prep because you'll get a much more natural nicer looking result okay now the other type of i guess indication for tissue graft is sometimes when i do my bone grafting you know if i'm if it's planned for an implant or even just implant or not you know if you're doing an extraction and you want to seal the socket you know we, we call these socket seals. So you can do it with either a collagen plug PRF or sometimes you can do it with connective tissue. So here's a case. This case was planned for immediate implant, but because of the way the, the architecture was in the site, we couldn't get an implant into the ideal position without, you know, because of the bone loss and the lack of stability. So we decided to do a socket seal. So we grafted first, so the tooth is atraumatically removed. We did some bone aloe graft into the site. I usually take a diamond bird to just remove some of the epithelium around the sulcus or internally within the sulcus so we can get blood supply. And then I just take a nice thick punch incision. This is like a free gingival graft. So there's epithelium there and a nice thick graft that is then measured and slid into the site. So here we kind of measured it to fit in. And then with little stitches, we hold it in position, almost like a tissue plug or a seal. And this will hold our bone graft material in and it keeps everything in nicely. You can see these are little micro surgical sutures. Again, if you're gonna do this, you have to use a small gauge suture because your graft is so small and to puncture so many holes into the graft, you have to do with a, a micro suture. This is how it's healed. So you can see the remnants of the graft mature nicely in there. So it allows us to basically make sure that there's not many bone particles lost, things heal and mature nicely. And then we get a nice band of nice tissue that can then be used to be deep epithelialized. So in this case, we actually cut this and tucked it in on the buckle when we place the implant. 
Here's another case, same concept. Now here, rather than using a, a plug type socket suit, we used a pedicle connected tissue graft. So here the tooth, you can see obviously it's a hopeless tooth due to the fracture. Socket is debrided and clean. Here in this case, she had no buckle plate at all. We had to slide in a membrane. We grafted the socket. I like to do all of these without removing or opening the flaps because this is an aesthetic area. I don't want to disrupt the papilla. I don't want to really open the flap if I don't have to. So I try to work with everything internally as much as I can. It's a little bit harder, but you get a better result aesthetically. Now, this is a connected tissue graft. Now, the connected tissue graft, this is a pedicle connected tissue graft. So that means that it's actually attached to the tissue from the palate. So you can see as I pull it, it's still attached from the palate tissue. What I do is I make a single incision on the palate side. We harvest our connected tissue graft. I start to cut it out from the distal. And then right at the mesial end, which ends right behind this socket, it's attached still to the tissue. And then what we do is we make a small incision internally from where I'm getting the graft through into the sulcus and it slides over the graft and gets tucked into the buckle and then it's held in place with the suture. So this is our connected tissue graft going from, you can see here, from the palate through that small incision, I sort of tunnel it underneath that little bridge of pal palatal tissue on the back of the sulcus. It slides over the socket, tucks into the buckle and seals the site. And this way it keeps our bone graft and you can see as, it, as it's healing at two weeks, it kind of swells up with fluid but it's good because I don't see any necrosis. There's no necrotic tissue. And as it heals, this is the site. So now again, we've kept our volume. It's maintained the contour. The, the tissue is nice and healthy. And again, what we find at the occlusal part will then be reused to be tucked into the buckle for additional buckle volume if we need to when we place our implant. So these are some of the other options that, you know, sealing sockets. So now I'm gonna talk about how we improve implant aesthetics. So we're, you know, we're getting towards the end. So implant aesthetics, like I said, in some cases, we have older implants that we need to make look more nicer. In this case, you can see the problem. The implant is out of the bone. You can see the thread through the tissue, but the, the implant itself was totally integrated. And you know, other than that, other than just this aesthetic area, the, it was fine, it was functional, there was no inflammation. So she, the, the patient just didn't like the fact that she could feel the threads now, you could see them, it was more of an aesthetic issue. So and she was terrified of parallel tissue. So in this case, I had to use dermal allograft, but because of what I was using it for, I didn't really mind to use it. So what I do here is because I don't want to open up the, the sulcular part of the site, because again, there's nothing wrong with the implant. You can see it's other than a little bit of plaque, it's healthy in the sense that there's no pocketing or an attachment. So I make a vestibular incision. I then create a pouch or tunnel across the surface of the implant so that I can gain access to the tissue above the implant. And what we do is we take a piece of alloderm and I fold it in half. So we double layer it to get more thickness. And then you can see here, so Azim, you're, you're wondering how I do the suture. So here the needle goes in to the tissue from the flap on the mesial. It comes out of the incision line. It grabs onto the actual graft itself and it goes back into the incision line, comes out of the same side of the buckle flap where I entered. And then what you do is you take the sutures and you pull the graft through. So here, and then it just ties out of the same place. So we just tie the knot. So this is what we call a purse string suture. It basically allows you to pull the graft into the flap where you need it to. And you can see now with that double layer of tissue over the site, it acts like a padding to protect and mask the, the grayness of the implant some sutures to just to close up the incision line. This is the day, the post-op when we see our two weeks. And this is once it all matured. So you can see how everything looks. You can see the grayness, all of it is all gone. Patient was happy. We didn't have to take tissue from our palate. So we got our result and our intended objective was done. This is another case. This patient came to me, had an implant done uh, a while back but eventually she just got tired of the way it looked. She just didn't like the aesthetics. You can't see it very closely, but, and in the photograph you can't see it, but when she smiles in natural light, because of the way the crown seats, it creates a shadow on the gums and she gets this like halo of grayness. And she was just very picky with the aesthetics and she's like, I just don't like the way it looks. So uh, upon further investigation, you can see how the, the implant or the restoration itself 
is like a ridge lap. It's like an overhang. So now you can see when light hits the front of it, it bounces off the tooth and then creates shadowing on the gums. And so this is mainly an issue. You know, the implant itself was positioned nicely. It was a screw retained implant. The, there's nothing wrong with it. But from a surgical point, they should have known that, wait a minute, there's a soft tissue deficiency. If you look closely, you can see there's actually a gap or space. And they had to leave it like this so that access for, I guess I'm assuming hygiene. So when I remove the crown, this is the way the, the, the crown looks. So you can see the ridge lap and the overlap. So I, I had, our plan was number one, I told her that you have to have a new crown place because the way this crown is, is shaped, it's part of the problem. The other issue is I said is you have a, a ridge volume deficiency. You know, you need to have uh, some grafting done, soft tissue graft to, to plump up the volume. So what we did was I, I we scanned the implant. I told the lab I need a temporary, but I need you to make the temporary to mimic the neighboring central and give me a better emergence. Don't, don't give me a ridge lap. I want to remove that emergence. So this is the temporary that they, they made. Okay, so this is done basically ahead of time. So the day of surgery, I'm inserting this temporary with the tissue graft at the same time because they're going to guide each other to help shape the tissues. So this is some dense fibrous connective tissue. You can see I'm just measuring it to see the depression. So I remove the, the old crown. I then tunnel into the site, creating a pouch. I insert my graft. You can see the graft is secured with two sutures. I'm not worried about coronally positioning anything because here we're just increasing the volume. So all I need is just that graft to push more buccally. So you can see here with the provisional in place, already you can see a marked difference. Now it looks like the tooth is coming out of the gums rather than sitting on top of it. Here's a different image or profile. This is at the two week mark. The stitches are removed. And this is how she looked once it matured. And once I said, okay, now you're, you're ready to go see the, the restorative doctor. And now this case, actually, I saw a picture of it on Instagram. It was, it ended up being restored, not by the dentist that referred her to me originally, but the patient had moved. So it was done by a prosthodontist. A local guy, Mario Rotella, really great guy, does awesome work, worked with Goth Sioux downtown. So they actually restored it. Unfortunately, I asked him for the image, but he hasn't sent it yet. So I don't have the final one. But this is with the provisional when she left my office ready to go. So you can see here, we, we've got a better profile. It looks now like the tooth is coming, emerging out of the gums, just like it's supposed to. And once they put a nice, beautiful crown on it, it's going to look really natural. And again, hard to tell there's an implant there once it's done. Here's another case. Here's a case of an immediate implant. So whenever I do immediate implants, because the, there's a deficiency between the prominence on a root and the actual positioning of the implant. So that deficiency or that void has to be filled with something. And so most of the time, we always do connective tissue grafts because in order to build that emergence and build that tissue, you need to have support for that volume. So again, tooth was extracted, immediate implant was placed, connective tissue graft was then tunneled into the site and sutured. And then a customized healing abutment was made to support the tissue. This is just at the two week mark. You can see now how plump and, and healthy the tissue is. This is once the implant was matured and integrated ready for the final restoration. So you can now see all the thick tissue and how healthy it looks. And this is the final restoration. Okay, so you can see now they actually did some crown work on the lateral as well. The, the canine itself is an implant. And now the premolar, you know, the one four, there's an implant. But you can see now the healthy, thick tissue profile. And, you know, from an aesthetic point, it just looks much nicer. Now, here's another case. Again, you know, for guys, you know, the key to doing aesthetic implant restorations is, is not bone, it's soft tissue. You know, you can make things like in this case here. This is actually a lady who has a flipper on. This is actually not a flipper. It's a cast partial denture. She's missing her one one. You can see there's a discrepancy in the crown shape. One is longer than the other, and that's because there's discrepancy in volume. You know, when we take it out, there's a volume deficiency. She had enough bone to place the implant, but there wasn't any buccal volume to create that natural emergence, and that's why her partial looked longer than it's supposed to be. So in this case, you know, I'm not going to go into details about the implant placement because we're talking about soft tissue, but implant is positioned ideally. It's put to the right depth to make sure that we're at least three to four millimeters from the CEJ. And then what I did was a pedicle connective tissue graft. So again, you can see this is attached on the parallel side. It's 
taken from the palate, just like how I showed before. It slid over the graft and the implant, and then everything is closed up. So now we've got a little bit more volume and support, and that's what I want. I want that volume so that I can use that to shape the tissue. Now, I also did what you do. This is actually once it's healed, but the day she left, I actually cut down the porcelain and trimmed down her partial denture so that we could fit. Because now that I've increased the volume, I'd had to adjust the partial so that she could still use it as a temporary. So I ground it out and adjusted it so that it could seat into the area. And then it puts a little bit of light pressure, which then sort of molds and supports the tissue. So once the graft is matured, this is what it looked like with the partial one. So now you can see automatically a much nicer tissue profile and gingival margin profile. So here, what we did was, uh, we actually, I skipped the step, but I basically uncovered the implant. I scanned the implant to get a provisional made, or to get, in this case, uh, to save her money. I just had a, a sh uh, basically, it was almost like a temporary crown shell that I basically hand reline in the mouth and I fabricate the provisional chair side. So that was a custom temporary abutment. This is what I get from the lab. It's just basically a crown shell. I reline it into the mouth, put a little bit of flowable and basically adjust it. I will then, you know, this is all done with flowable chair. So I just adjust the contours of the tooth and, and the shape. And then I polish it to make sure that it can shape and, and, and press and add pressure to the tissues where I need to now that I've built up that volume. So this is then inserted into the site. And with a little bit of pressure, it sort of bulks out. Now you can see as the as the provisional seats in, you can see how it almost puffs out and, and shapes the papillas and, and gets that buckle profile nicely. And then this is it after it's matured. Usually this was two weeks after. Now this poor lady, this was done right before our, our break with the virus. So I'm hoping her temporary is still in place. But she, now she's at the point where she's now ready to go see the dentist. Actually, she's going to be seeing a prosthodontist, I think, too do the final crown on this. So you can see key point here is look at how the tooth emerges from the, the tissues, the papillas and everything look nice. It's got symmetry with the, with the two one. And you know, once you get a nice, you know, realistically looking crown there, it's, it's gonna look much, much nicer than what she ended up with. So, you know, again, soft tissues, what was a the key there? Here's a case, lady had, uh, it was actually a um, cantilevered, restoration off of the canine and what happened was at some point the whole thing just fractured off so now it's not restored and uh, it's now you know it was referred for us to place an implant now the implant the plan was to also place an implant at the one three site immediately and then the final restoration would have a cantilever restoration for the lateral because the spacing wasn't big enough to have a large lateral and with these small laterals it's, it's a, a good approach to just cantilever the restoration of the canine. So one thing to note is the original crown had a sort of ridge lap pontic. And so what I wanted to do is bulk up the, the, the tissue and the volume at the lateral site so that we get something more aesthetic so that I wanted the tooth to look like it's emerging again out of the gums rather than sitting on top of it. So tooth was removed, implant was placed, the gap around the implant was sealed in uh, grafted with bone. I use a temporary coping, uh, a temporary abutment here. And then I created a customized healing abutment just because this is a canine, I wanted to keep the shape and the profile and the prominence. And then there's our connected tissue graft. Here the connected tissue graft is then tunneled into the site over the area to bulk up the volume and get a lot more plumpness because the more tissue I have, the easier it is to mold and shape. So this is just a occlusal view. You can see now we have plenty of volume there. So looks good. This is once it's healed, you can actually see the tissue actually grew over the healing above. And so we actually got more than I actually needed. It just cre crept up naturally. So we just kind of adjusted and trimmed that. I then took a scan of the actual implant and I wanted to start to do the tissue shape because with these, in my case, in my office, Whenever someone sends me an anterior aesthetic case, I always do the provisional and shape it unless they tell me otherwise, because I basically want to hand it to them with a slam dunk. Like basically I make it dummy proof. I say, okay, I've done everything. I've done the provisional. All you got to do is take an impression, get a good lab. I even insist that they have the patient see the ceramics to, to sit there with them and get the staining and the color perfect. And 
you know, it's the only way to sort of make sure that you really get a nice natural result. So here we used a, a, a model that was basically milled as a cantilever restoration. And I, I told them to make both on the model, make them look like they're again emerging out of the gums because then what I'm going to do is at the time of insertion, I'm going to now mold and shape it and that excess tissue that I have to be able to fit. So here you can see they adjusted the provisional to make it look like it's coming out of the gums. And here's our, our site. Now you can see, here's, I love this picture because this is what a customized healing abutment does. Look at that shape and that profile. You don't get these from regular healing abutments, you know, because teeth are not circular, you know? So this is a canine. You can see the, the emergence, the prominence, all of that is preserved because of that customized healing abutment. So what I do now is, I then take a round diamond burr and I put a dimple into the tissues where the pontic is because I want pressure. I want the pontic to add some pressure into the site to allow it to create the look of a papilla. So this is the provisional then inserted in. You can see some blanching there because of the pressure, which I want. You know, blanching usually it's there for about five minutes and then disappears, but we want that pressure because it's going to shape and mold the tissues. And I want the, the look of papilla. So we're going to create a papilla out of nothing. This is after it has been matured. So you can see now the shaping and the papillas look good. And this is the best part. You can see the corona, like I guess occlusal angle. You can see all of that thick tissue, the profile, everything is perfect. There's no deficiency, no indentation. And the best part is when I take off the provisional, look at that nice papilla. Here's a better eye view. So look at it. So this is all just soft tissue and shaping. Okay, so like I said, this is what I give back to the dentist. You know, when you send a case to me, you get this back and all you have to do is, is uh, take a customized impression coping and make it. If you guys are not from, if the dentist is not familiar with it, then I just make it for them in the office and then I send it with the patient so that you have to capture this profile. So you have to make a customized impression coping for these cases or else you will lose them. You can see the tissues are really nice, really perfect. And, and this is, you know, this is a practice builder for me, you know, so I don't make money out of doing provisionals and doing all this stuff because you can't charge for it and what you charge and the time it takes. I'm not a prosthodontist. So it takes me a little bit longer. I'm a surgeon. So I don't do this for money. It's more a little bit of passion because I want the case to look amazing. And also when the dentist gets this back, they're like, wow. So it's also, again, a practice builder for me. And if the patient is happy, then dentist is happy and I am happy. Everybody's happy, you know? So this is my office. Hopefully I'll be here more regularly. This is my office in Oakville. So for you guys, just a little bit of intro about me. I'm doing this at the end. You know, I work out of two clinics, one in Oakville, one in Mississauga. The image below behind in the background is the actual Oakville office. And in Mississauga, I work in a larger practice with multiple partners. Okay, so if anybody is interested in getting a hold of me or working with me, uh, these are the two email uh, uh, websites you can get access to referral pads and, and just contact information to get a hold of me if you want to talk to me or discuss maybe working together on some cases okay the other thing I asked is uh, you know what I've been doing during this break is I had been asked from one of my referrals I don't know if any of you guys know Stephen Phelan or Phelan Dental Seminars he does a is a great online platform for occlusion and cosmetic uh, dentistry. I think he does like full mouth reconstructions for like veneers and, and video cases and things like that. But he's, he's, he, I work with him a lot. I've been working with him for 10 years. So I, I do a lot of his surgeries. And so he's always been bothering me about doing uh, some surgery content for his online platform. So we ended up now because of the virus and that's been shut down. I had some time. So we built this online program to teach you how to do bone grafting case. So if anyone is interested, it's, you know, has multiple modules. It basically is a subscription based offer where you basically join, you know, the first six core modules go over the, the basics and the foundations of doing bone grafting procedures. And then throughout the year, there's a monthly webinar, which will be usually live cases and videos of surgeries and stuff. And this is, it's online because he has uh, subscribers or dentists from all over the world. You know, we've opened this up, you know, a month ago, it's going to be, we sort of take our memberships every month. Uh, if you guys are interested, it is open 
it's going to be open actually soon in June, I think, middle of June, we're going to open it up. So if you want any information or you're interested in looking into what this is or, or you have any interest in learning bone grafting or working with, with me online, we have a private Facebook group, there's chats, and it's sort of like online mentorship. Just contact Amanda at phelandentalseminars.com and uh, she will give you all the details and information that you need to know. Okay, so if anyone's interested, this is the place uh, to go to learn a little bit of bone grafting. Okay, so I am done, guys. Perfect. That was awesome, man. Thank you so much. That was, I'm just going to actually uh, take your screen off here. Um, so yeah, so thank you so much. Um, that was uh, phenomenal. I think we've got a ton of questions here. We're going to get through as many as we can. Oh. So I'm going to fire these off kind of like just question style. And if you can, uh, quite a bit here. So we'll try to get as many as we can. Okay. Yeah. The first question is just um, a review of where, where do you use a full versus a partial thickness graft? Because you mentioned. Uh, I'm assuming they mean flap. Oh, that must've been flap. Okay. Well, so it depends on what your intention is. Okay. For, for any type of on lay graft or type of free genital graft where you're putting graft onto tissue, it's always a split thickness flap. You don't want to expose the bone. Uh, other times when you do a, uh, like for example, for crony position, normally if the tissue is thicker, you can do a split thickness flap. I usually start off with split thickness near the papillas and then I do full thickness and then I split it again to release the flap. You know, but if it's really, really thick, you can pretty much, and you're very good with your sharp dissection, then you can technically split it all the way down. Okay, perfect. Um, any pearls on suturing techniques that of, uh, in particular, the recipient, um, you know, the recipient site, uh, just any pearls as far as like how to, how to improve your suturing skills, I guess you would say, I guess would be the question. Uh, you know what, to be honest, the only way you can improve, like suturing is it's, it's a, it's a manual thing, you know, to build your manual dexterity, you have to practice, yeah. you know, you have to be able to be comfortable with whichever needle holder you're using and practice so to train outside of someone's mouth uh practice on models you know if you can invest in having a typodont uh put a typodont on your chair and practice because suturing on a tabletop with a model is a lot different than trying to retract and hold flat and suture and then the other thing is you know any extraction that you're doing in your office or if you're doing any procedures practice you, you know what do a stitch over an extraction the more you practice the better you'll get okay um, do you, uh, when you create a pouch, does it have to be split thickness? I know our goal is to keep it split thickness. Um, but, uh, I mean, obviously that's hard to do. So usually like. the, because it's a blunt dissection, cause technically it's supposed to be split thickness because you're just stuffing the, the, the elevator through the tissues. Sometimes you may end up getting a little bit of full things, but then once you, you put the orbit in and you dissect it, it becomes partially split thickness. So to be honest, it doesn't really matter, but there has to be a part of that internal tunnel that's split or else you won't get chrome position. Yeah. Okay. Um, are you using any copac in particular? Like once you do your grafting, are you using copac? No. So I, I've never used copac in my practice. Uh, copac is, it's, it's good only for holding things in position, but it has a lot of negatives. It holds plaque and, and bacteria in, you know, if it sometimes it doesn't even stay in place. Uh, tissues, when it cut, when you remove the copac, look more red and irritated and inflamed. So I don't. Usually the goals that uh, copac are used for, I do that with suturing. So for me, I don't use copac. Okay. And do you normally find that connective tissue grafting is less painful than a free gingival graft or about the same? I mean, you know what? it depends on the patient. On average, connective tissue graft, you know, like for example, a tunneled approach connective tissue graft is less pain, painful than, I mean, yeah, than a free gingival graft. But if you suture everything well and you seal it up, some people even don't even complain about free gingival grafts. They're like, oh, I'm surprised. I hurt for maybe two days and that was it. Mm -hmm. so, it has to do with, I guess, you know, how you manipulate the tissues. If you're rough and you tear and things, then they'll be more uncomfortable. If you're clean and fine with your incisions and everything closes up nicely, then it's less painful. And the suture thing. Yeah. Key, one more thing is when you take your free genome graft, the thinner it is, the less pain. The deeper you go, the more pain. So 
Again, you only, like I said, need one to 1.5 millimeters. Don't go too deep. If you go deep, that's where all the pain starts because remember your nerve endings and everything are deeper in there. Got it. Now the suturing that you're, the suture material that you're using, that would be a, from what I gathered from what I saw, it was like a 6 proline, which is a non-resorbable suture. Yeah. So most of my, you know, most of my work actually, I, I use chromic gut sometimes. I usually tend to use resorbable for the donor site. So in the palate, I'll use either uh, monocryl glycolon or chromic gut, but act at the surgical site where I'm putting the graft, I like to use, my favorite is proline, 6 proline. Okay, perfect. Now, what if you're dealing in the mental foramen area? I mean, are you, how are you managing that grafting in that area, depending on the extent of the recession and the position of the nerve? Okay, so first of all, if I'm concerned, I'll, I, I need to know where it is. So either radiographically, or if I really, really need to know, I'll take a CT scan. Uh, I'm not too concerned when I tunnel because obviously, remember, you only really need to tunnel past the attached tissue. You don't need to keep going down to the, you know, deep in the vestibule because once the tissue, you're past the attached tissue, it's just mucosa. So you can really release it. And very rarely will a case have recession way down deep into the vestibule. And if it does, then it's treated with a flap. So if I'm doing a flap, then I will locate the mental frame and just like how you do in a ridge augmentation case. Okay. Um, we've seen some cases in the past with like some composite that's used to actually hold, you know, you see, they kind of take the suture, they lift up the two ends and then they slam some composite to kind of hold. Yeah. So there's a few guys they've published. So you can either put composite on the actual buckle surface and hold the stitch there or at the contact points. It works. I only don't like doing it because I'm the one that has to remove it. And that sucks. Yeah. You know, so... So I'll only use it, I use it very rarely. I use it when I really need to push up the papilla. Like for example, in a case where I'm trying to reconstruct or rebuild the papilla, then I'll use it. But for most grafting, as you can see, it's not really needed. Yeah. Now you showed a few immediate cases. I'm, I love immediates. Um, have you, what's the difference? Like when do you decide you would do a connective tissue at the time of the immediate? Um, and do you find that there's a difference if you don't do it versus you do do it? I mean, it's based on the tissue biotype? Uh, well, it depends on two things. Uh, one is remember if I'm just going to, like, remember, it depends on the size of the implant. Okay, so when you compare the, the collar of your implant to the actual size of the actual tooth at the, at the emergence, if there's a huge discrepancy, then usually I will add connective tissue because that tends to collapse. So I have two things that are holding my tissue. One is either a, a provisional or a customized healing abutment, which then has that emergence as it emerges, you know, it goes from the margin down to the platform of the implant. And then in that void, because that soft tissue, you know, I, I put tissue to fill that void because I don't want to have a really, you know, I want to have that nice S curve. So in that S curve, that the, the volume that's missing because of the difference between the platform width and the actual root of the tooth, that's filled with connective tissue. So most anterior cases, I do connective tissue. I always find the tissue is just thicker and nicer and healthier once I do it. Uh, if they have a really thick biotype, then it's not necessary, then I may not do it. And now as far as like performing two procedures, we got a few questions about charging. Like is that something that you would obviously have to bill for because you're doing a, an immediate implant with some bone grafting and in addition to that, a connective tissue graft especially something like, uh, uh, you know, the one that, that rotates, that's not easy to do. It's very time consuming. Right. So, uh, yeah, I mean, like these bases, so yeah. So if I'm, let's say like, if I'm doing an immediate implant and a connected tissue graft and a custom healing, well, yeah. So I charge all those codes in my procedure. Yeah. So it is more expensive than just putting an implant in. Yes. Yeah, of course. But I always, I don't charge full fee. Like if they're paying for an implant, they're paying for a provisional, they're paying for this, uh, I basically reduce it because if I'm charging full fee in the fee guide, it's just going to add up to like, you know, $6,000, you know, yeah. just for the surgery. So I reduce it enough. Sometimes what I'll do is I know that implants are not covered, but tissue graphs are. So sometimes I'll take away some from the implant and add it to the tissue graph and I'll kind of balance it out. But on average, I kind of round it off to a number that everyone is happy with. Okay. And then the final question was, um, you know, about lingual grafting. Um, you know, we have a lot of patients who come in with that lingual recession. And mm -hmm. I know in my case, they always ask, you know, can we do a graft? Or is that something that the periodontist can do? 
because I know I can't do it. <laughs> um, uh, free gingival connective tissue, like what, have you seen those cases, performed those? Well, <laughs> yeah, we, normally these are the ones everyone sends to us, <laughs> but uh, you can do either. So you can do a free gingival graft or you can do a connective tissue graft. Uh, it all depends on the site specifically. Sometimes, you know, if there's bone loss and one tooth has a little bit more recession or let's say a, a mucogenital defect or tear, then I'll tend to do a free gingival graft if I don't think I can get the root coverage. If I think I can get the root coverage, then I do a connective tissue graft, either through a tunnel or I open like a flap like I showed in the case. Yeah, and of course, you'd have to be careful with the anatomy, which, you know. Yeah, so with these, again, you don't go dig. Like, if I'm concerned about the anatomy, then I'll open a flap so that I can actually score the periosteum exactly where I, I see it, rather than just kind of going blind. Right on. Good. Okay, excellent. Well, that was, that was phenomenal, Nahid, uh, Dr. Muhammad. That was uh, great. Thank you so much for spending the time with us. I'm just going to actually share my screen here so I can review a few things with our, to finalize, and we're going to be giving our um, verification code as well. So um, again, I would like to th thank Dr. Nahid Mohammed. Uh, you know, these presentations are not easy to put together. He uh, was asked, uh, you know, uh, with I what I consider somewhat of short notice. So thank you so much for doing this. Um, he has great content, um, great stuff. We've gone through the questions. Just make sure that you do check out his Instagram page um, and his I will send out his information to all the members once I send out the C. So if anybody wants to contact him and review cases, then he's more than open. Um, just to kind of end off, we do have our final, our new year coming up, as I mentioned. So I will send out everyone uh, basically a registration form for those people who are interested. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me at uh, drshake at livedentalsurgery.com. But I'm really excited about this coming year. We have some great things going on. Lots of hands-on stuff. To be honest with you, this meeting, I was hoping to actually have hands-on. So the surprise for our members, it was going to be, a you'd show up and you'd have a pig jaw and Nahid Muhammad, and we would be doing some free, you know, doing hands-on. So I think we're going to try to get uh, Dr. Muhammad out again to our group uh, to kind of give us a, more of a hands-on type of approach. But uh, in the meantime, I'm looking forward to, um, you know, our new year. Uh, we have had some great members, some great relationships. And I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to all of you guys joining back up again and, and also uh, in increasing our membership. So uh, make sure that you check out our websites and our Instagram page as well. And I did want to thank everyone for coming out today. Um, our C verification code is going to be May 28th, so M-A-Y 28, and then Odin. So if you can just do me a favor, we're going to keep this chat open. Um, just make sure that you enter the following, which is going to be your the C verification code your name, email address, and then your um, AGD number if you have one. And from that, I will then go ahead and um, uh, just send out the C verification codes, uh, sorry, the C um, uh, course certificates for everybody. So um, again, I wanted to thank everybody. It was an amazing year at the Ontario Dental Implant Network. We grew, we had a 60 members, core members. We're hoping to, to grow that so we can have more power, whether it's group purchasing, whether it's sharing stuff, I know it's been amazing during COVID to have everybody on board. I hope those of you who've joined recently to our group, I think now we have 165 dentists on our group chat, uh, many of which are local. Um, hopefully you guys can come on board. We, we really need your support and uh, hopefully we can start sharing and spreading and learning um, the dental love amongst each other so we can grow in our own practices. So um, with that said, I will stop sharing my screen and uh, I think we're just gonna let this, let me just see here. So everybody's still pushing their stuff through. Um, and uh, just a few uh, closing remarks here as far as the membership goes. So uh, what I'm going to do is just send out the membership uh, form to everybody. If you do have any questions, let me know. Um, it will go on the Odin group chat forum, which I mentioned for those of you who are not part of it, I'm actually gonna keep it open for the next week to two weeks because I think we're gonna have some pretty important information coming out um, where it comes to guidance on opening your practice once we get the guidelines. Uh, we'll also have some uh, important courses or webinars to help you and your team, more importantly, your team and your staff. I think that's gonna be important to try to give them some kind of structure. And I think all of you already know that our goal has been only one thing, which has been to help each other navigate dentistry 
um, and then also support each other from a personal standpoint and a business and, a, and, and an education standpoint as well. And, uh, you know, I've been pleased and, and proud to have you guys all uh, trust me with, 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 you know, guiding you guys throughout this, uh, throughout your careers and being a mentor. And we have wonderful people like Dr. Muhammad and also Dr. Shurgan Hasham, who's on, who's on board, uh, who've been able to help out with that. And we, we're, we're going to do nothing more but make it better for the coming year. So uh, again, look forward to seeing you guys all at our first meeting on July 8th, pending COVID and how many people we can get together. Um, it may be pushed out. Uh, and then of course, the, the further the, the calendar goes, um, we'll go through the different topics. And if anything comes up, let us know, but I'm always here for you guys. Okay, guys. So Hisham, I think uh, we are pretty good. Did I, I'm hoping everybody had a chance to enter their information. Okay, just make sure you enter the verification code, your name and email. Yeah, we'll give it a couple more, maybe about um, another 60 more seconds. So if you haven't entered your email information, the, um, the code and your full name, please do so as well. We're going to go ahead and close the chat line in about 20 seconds. Yeah. And one final thing, as you know, I've been pushing hard with my team, with our team on business interruption. Uh, we finally got ODA to send out an email. Um, that came at a lot of effort, let me tell you, uh, with legal threats, so on and so forth. But just please make sure. Um, thank you, uh, Leila and Reem, for your, for your encouragement. I'm, I'm honored to be your men mentor, and, and I'm, you guys are my mentors as well. So, um, but uh, just please make sure that you spread the message, because every member we want to sign up, have access to business interruption, whether you're an Aviva client or not. Um, I'm not. I'm with Intact. Um, but uh, we're hoping that Shaw, Hyacin, Surgical Room, they'll also help spread the message to their clientele so we can get as many doctors on board so you all have access to business interruption. Um, and, uh, and again, um, you know, these are just some of the few things that we're doing as part of Ontario Dental Implant Network to help the general dentist and their community at lar and our community at large. And I know this is the same philosophy that Hasham has at Dentistry Academy, which is why we've been working so amazingly well together. And we're looking forward to have a stronger relationship moving forward as well. Uh, we got some amazing things in the works. I know that from Hisham's aspect as well. Um, so uh, with that said, I think, uh, I think we are good, guys. So um, thank you, guys. Stay safe. You're going to hear more from me. But the group chat is still active. It's still open for the next week or two to everybody to participate. And I will keep you guys all posted and uh, look out for the registration form coming soon. All right, guys. Well, thank you, guys. Have a wonderful evening. And again, thanks to Sham and Dr. Muhammad for, um, you know, being a part of this and helping uh, make things go so smoothly. We learned a ton and look forward to seeing you guys in person. Have a great night, guys. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.